All rise. The Court of Impeachment of the Texas Senate is now in session. The Honorable Lieutenant Governor and President of the Senate, Dan Patrick, now presiding. Morning, everyone. Bales, please bring in the jury. And judge, at this time, I would have, I do have a matter I'd like to bring up at the, at the bench, if that's okay. After the prayer? Yes, please. judge. And after the jury comes in. Good morning, members of the jury. Uh, Senator Hanahosa, I understand you're going to do the prayer this morning. Please come forward. Good morning. Uh, please, uh, let's bow our heads. Lord, we come before you today acknowledging that our understanding is imperfect and limited. We ask for your guidance and direction in every aspect of our lives. As we walk down unfamiliar paths, we ask for your guidance. Open our eyes, sharpen our senses so, so that we may use good judgment in every situation and decision we encounter. Help us to be patient. Help us to avoid making rash decisions and impulsive actions that may lead us astray. We understand that our choices have the power to shape our future. For that reason, we ask for your wisdom and guidance. Help us make wise decisions as we trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Senator. Please be seated. Counselor, you wanted to approach the bench? allyship with Ken Paxton. We're talking about a person who came to work for Ken Paxton because he truly shared the same deeply religious conservative values. And so he talked about 
uh, the disappointment that he felt mm -hmm. once he began learning things about Ken Paxton that he believed were not only adverse to those uh, deeply core values, but also in addition to that, according to him, he believed they were illegal. Right, and you know, Ed, he said, I think, perhaps the, the most powerful thing he said yesterday when he was describing what was happening with Paxton and his request to overturn a opinion from the Attorney General related to whether or not foreclosure sales could happen um, during the pandemic and this was all happening really over a weekend in the midnight hours and he said that he was acting quote he was acting like a man with a gun to his head and so really powerful to just imagine the Attorney General he, he described sort of erratic phone calls, calling him all through the night, suggesting language of what should be included in the opinion, which is really rare for the Attorney General to, and the to get into that. And the overall picture that the prosecution is trying to paint with these two, pic uh, with these two witnesses is that Ken Paxton was showing an unusual, a, a sh strikingly unusual amount of attention into anything related to Nate Paul. Actually, I was very struck by the line of questioning uh, regarding Ryan Bangert yesterday and Ken Paxton's effort, seeming, uh, seeming effort to obtain law enforcement information mm -hmm. concerning an ongoing FBI and law enforcement investigation into Nate Paul with uh, Ryan Bangor testifying that Ken Paxton was trying to go against long tradition within the AG's office with regard to trying to obtain information regarding that law enforcement investigation into Nate Paul, which again, tradition of the AG's office that almost always uh, the AG's office protects information as part of an ongoing investigation. Ashley, I was thinking about this this morning. It was one of the first things I thought about when I, when I got up, and I thought that people uh, maybe could really relate to this. When you think about the Uvalde shooting investigation, yes. for example, we saw so much public interest in investigative material in that investigation. And when you think that Ken Paxton in his office so vigorously stood with the Texas Department of Public Safety in shielding those records, then we have Nate Paul, who has a friendship by every account with Ken Paxton. And we now are learning, according to the witnesses, that Ken Paxton was trying to obtain and potentially disseminate law enforcement information from a from a uh, pending investigation it's hard to wrap your mind around right. frankly and sealed information that's so, right so not in not even something you and i make pi you know we make these public right. information requests all the time generally after an investigation is closed and we're trying to get information and we are not allowed to get it oftentimes if the law enforcement agency fights us the ag's office uh protects them rather than giving it to us. So to imagine that there are sealed documents about this ongoing federal investigation and that he's saying, yes, we should give it to him. We should give it to him. And and, and Ryan Banger saying that he and the staff, uh, one of the things that they, one of the issues that they raised with the Attorney General is this idea of precedent. Well, if you're going to do it in this instance, what are you going to do the next time that a party uh, of an investigation, a target of an investigation is seeking similar type information? There was also interesting uh, action from the defense. Obviously, we haven't gotten to the point where the defense is questioning Banger yet, but we all heard the word hearsay a lot yesterday. Oh my so goodness. many yes. objections on hearsay, 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 uh, to the point where it, <laughs> it, I found it almost comical that Rusty Hardin decided to define what hearsay is for Dan right. Patrick because the defense was saying everything was hearsay. Which brings up an interesting point. I was talking to some attorneys last night who said, look, they believe this is an instance where, uh, you know, the parties may be um, kind of playing off the fact that Dan Patrick is not an attorney. Absolutely. And so he may not, for example, know or fully and deeply understand what hearsay is or have a lot of experience, have any experience for that matter, making a determination about what hearsay is or isn't.
And now, obviously, we do want to point out that, and you can see standing around Dan Patrick and seated to his right, he has his own legal team that's actually a judge uh, on his right there who is helping to advise him throughout all of this. And, and that is interesting. He got to pick his own legal team because he's not a lawyer, because he's not a judge, but he is presiding over this trial to have someone to sort of be there with him to advise him as he's making his decisions um, moving forward. That's Judge Elena Myers, who is advising him as as this trial moves forward. And a lot of conversation just uh, among people I was talking to last night about the nature of the cross-examination that we saw of Jeff Mateer from Tony Busby yesterday. Tony Busby clearly trying to land some punches but I think it's an open question about just how effective that was, whether or not he may have turned some jurors on or turned some of them off, Ashley. Again, just looking at the screen mm -hmm. there, by the way, uh, whatever issue they were trying to attempt to handle at the bench appears like maybe it has ended. We've seen Rusty Harden take the podium there, maybe to go back to questioning of Ryan Bangert. Yeah, and to your point about throwing punches, not just punches related to the trial, but personal attacks on Jeff Mateer as well, you know, kind of almost taunting about how he lost the opportunity to serve as a federal judge and whether or not um, there were Republican senators who supported him. And so, uh, you know, I think that also really sort of speaks to what's happening here in terms of what Ken Paxton has been saying is that this is the establishment. This is a witch hunt. This is these are rhinos who are just after me and they want me out because I'm so conservative. But I think uh, from from, again, some, some legal experts and local attorneys I was talking to last night about about this, I think it's an open question or at least they relate. It's an open question in their mind about whether or not Tony Busby effectively landed any any punches. In other words, did he really uh, strike at the core of Jeff Mateer's testimony? Did he really unravel Jeff Mateer's sentiment and his statements that he believed that the attorney general was doing something illegal, that he uh, tried to wave him off of this and warn him about his interactions with Nate Paul, potentially acting on behalf of or at the behest of Nate Paul. We saw Tony Busby kind of talk about other topics, uh, you know, concerning Jeff Mateer's correspondence and the degree to which he kept those or didn't. But again, uh, whether or not uh, he really struck to the heart of Jeff Mateer's testimony, I think, is, is something that people are debating today. Well, and, and so you had Jeff Mateer talking about how unethical he thought Ken Paxson's actions were, and then you saw Busby question him about the hiring of his personal lawyer. And Correct. so I thought that was particularly interesting because uh, Mateer's personal lawyer was hired around the time that this is all unfolding, that they're going to the FBI. But this is also someone whom the attorney general's office was considering hiring as outside counsel. And Mateer actually told the AG's office to set aside $50,000 yeah. was the number that Busby threw out um, to potentially pay him. Now, the AG's office decided not to hire him. Right. But when we're talking about questionable behavior, yes. why did you do that? I think he is sort of driving home the point where, well, you also have had behavior. You've had your fingerprints, yes, yes, and your fingerprints on on different things that are eyebrow raising. Article one, so yes. article one, with it, which is the intervention of the attorney general's office into a lawsuit between the Mitty Foundation and Nate Paul. Again, Mateer, who you know, the house managers are accusing the attorney general of improperly, uh, you know, intervening, but. Busby is saying, but Mateer, you were on the lawsuit. You you signed right. off on this as well. I did think, Ashley, that that testimony yesterday related to the hiring of Johnny Sutton, uh, former federal prosecutor himself, former U.S. attorney here in the Western District of Texas himself. Johnny Sutton ha is well respected in, in our area, has been involved in a number of important cases outside of his uh, role as former U.S. attorney. And, and I did think that was an interesting piece of testimony. Um, we'll come to order. And now let's Senate go to uh, the Senate floor motion, where Dan Patrick uh, is starting the proceeding. Uh, you asked if there are any statements from this witness. 
Are there any statements from this witness you have not turned over? No, Your Honor. The only thing you have are work product notes? That's all we have. All right. Uh, Okay, be at, the, be at the microphone, please. There are, there are no statements from this witness. Uh, we, uh, we have notes that we have, or our mental uh, processes and everything as to what he said in summary of different things and issues, but no notes and no, sta and no notes have any statement from the witness. If there are any statements you discover, they need to be turned over. That's absolutely right. All right, right. motion's Thanks. denied. Yes, Judge. Bailiff will call the witness in. So again, the witness coming to the stand right now, Ryan Bangard, he's the former deputy first assistant to the attorney general. So we heard from Jeff Mateer on days one and two of the trial. He was the first assistant. Ryan is directly under him as the deputy first assistant. That's correct. And again, uh, one of those eight original whistleblowers who went to the FBI in the fall of 2020 to say, we believe our boss, the attorney general, is committing a number of felony offenses. Ryan Bangert also taking time at the request of Rusty Harden yesterday to talk about um, his previous allegiance to Kim Paxton, why he wanted to work oh, with him. Still under oath from yesterday, Mr. Banger. That what they've worked saying? together in the past? Council and that they to the, come into the AG's office? And that they shared those deeply conservative values. Let's go hear from Ryan Banger now. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I want to go, if I can, back a little bit from where we broke up uh, yesterday. Uh, back to the MIDI Foundation issue uh, and your involvement in that. After the in, in, intervention that you've testified about on June the 2nd of, of 2020, uh, did the Attorney General contact you personally uh, about that issue again? We did have conversations subsequent to the intervention, All yes. Right. And, and what was the occasion? Did you attend any meeting with the Attorney General about it? Uh, I did attend a meeting with him. Um, we were having a senior staff meeting. We had a weekly meeting every week where all of the deputies would gather in the main conference room, and he did request my presence at a off-site meeting to discuss the MIDI Foundation. Can you give us a time? Uh, the meetings happened in the morning, uh, roughly mid-morning. Um, it was, I believe, after the intervention, but it was prior to... Uh, my being removed from the case by first assistant Mateer. All right, so uh, what, would, what did he say? Just if you could repeat what he said to you and asked for. Uh, he came to me in the meeting. The meeting had already started. He approached me and said, I need you to come with me to lunch. And did he say any further? Who was the lunch going to be with? Nate Paul. What did he say to you as to why he wanted you to go to lunch with Nate Paul? Uh, he didn't say specifically at that time. He just said we needed to go and have lunch with Nate Paul. Did he indicate why he wanted you to go to lunch with Nate Paul? It became clear subsequent to that what the meeting was about, yes. What was your position at that time that you had stated to him before the intervention and even at the time of the intervention as to whether you were opposed or unopposed to it? I was very uncomfortable with the intervention. We had discussed it. Uh, there were ongoing conversations after the intervention uh, that made me even more uncomfortable with our position in that case. Uh, and I had communicated to him what I believe were the pros and cons, and we were very heavy on the con side. So where did you go to lunch? I believe it was Polvo's. It was a Mexican restaurant downtown. And uh, who went to the lunch with you? Well, it was, we, we had to go through some gymnastics to even make the lunch happen. Um, I, it was with uh, the Attorney General and Drew Wicker um, from the Attorney General's office and Nate Paul, of course. How many weeks after the intervention and after you had expressed your opposition to it, how many weeks after that would it, this luncheon have been? It would have been one to two weeks after is my best guess. I can't tell you precisely, but it was, it was sometime in mid-June. It was very warm. Did he ever ask you to go to lunch with anybody that represented the Mitty Foundation? No. 
Did he ever ask you to go to lunch with the lawyers representing the Mitty Foundation? No. In the entire litigation that had been going on for several years, did he ever ask you to meet with anybody other than Nate Paul, one of the parties to the litigation? In connection with that case, no. All right. Now, when you arrived at lunch, can you describe the lunch for us, please? We, the Attorney General drove us over to Nate Paul's office, which is not far from our office, and left his car there. And as I recall, we piled into Nate, Nate Paul's car, and then he drove to Polvo's. As a lawyer, what was your reaction to being asked, did you consider it an ask or a directive? Let me ask you that first. Objection relevance. I, I've simply asked you, I've given him a choice. I'm not telling yeah, what you Overruled, you can ask the question. Thank you. It was not a request to which I could say no for reasons that I can explain. Please. The reasons why were Jeff Mateer and I discussed briefly the request that I go to lunch with Nate Paul. And we very quickly determined that it would be an objection appropriate. Objection to hearsay. He's talking about a conversation with Jeff Mateer. <laughs> Let me re-ask it a, a certain way if I can. Thank Please you, Your Honor. sustain that and re-ask. Thank you very much. All right. Let's go back now to uh, apparently more happened on their initial request. Let's go back to when, at the meeting, he wanted you to go to lunch with Nate Paul. What was your initial reaction when he asked you that? I was concerned that I was being asked to meet with the principal of a party in a lawsuit to which we had intervened. And so, without going into what, Mr. Mateer, and you said, who did you go to talk to? I visited with the Attorney General, and I explained to him that there were ethical concerns because as counsel for the state of Texas, I would be meeting with a represented party in a lawsuit to which the state of Texas had intervened. So what did you ask to him if you could do and what did you do? I explained to him Objection that- Objection, hearsay. What? It's Objection not, it's hearsay. a conversation with the attorney general. It's overruled. I explained to the attorney general that the only way that we could properly make this work under the rules of ethics is if there was a waiver from Nate Paul's counsel allowing me to, to speak directly with a represented party. My assumption was that that would terminate the request and we could go back to the meeting. So was that the course that you took after you privately consulted with Mr. Mateer? Yes. All right. And then when you told the, the attorney general that, what did he do? He went back to his office for a short amount of time and emerged with a document that purported to be a written waiver from Nate Paul's counsel, giving me permission to meet with Nate Paul without his lawyers present. Mr. Banger, how long did it take the Attorney General of the state of Texas to go into his office, contact the counsel for Nate Paul, and get a document prepared that waived any objection that lawyer would have to you talking uh, directly to Mr. Paul. Objection, speculation. This witness doesn't know what Mr. Paxton did in his office. I, the question was whether, how long it took. Overruled. Thank you, excuse me, thank you. No more than 15 minutes. And what was the, what was the document he brought it back to you in 15 minutes? Uh, I will, my recollection is it was a document that had been faxed or emailed to him. It was not something that I believe he would prepared. The appearance of it was not something that he would have prepared. But it was a document that had prepared, been prepared by one of Nate Paul's lawyers, waiving any conflicts that might arise from me as counsel for the state of Texas, meeting with a represented party. All right. Well, after that process and all, did you feel free to decline the lunch meeting? Or what was your reaction? What did you do? Well, I told Mr. Mateer that uh, he had gotten a waiver, and I was pretty much straight out of luck at that point. I had to go. Now, uh, when, you, when you went to Mr. Paul's office, um, where was his office, by the way? It was in downtown Austin, uh, south of here, but I don't recall specifically the location. And when you uh, went, 
I mean, you actually, you guys actually went and got in his office and got in his car and went in his car? We went and parked in his parking lot and got in his car. Describe the lunch for us. Where, you know, did you sit in a, a public area or a private area or what? We went to Polvo's. Uh, yeah, I recall the layout of the restaurant. It was Polvo's uh, downtown. Uh, we went into the restaurant. If I recall correctly, Nate Paul wanted to sit outside, even though it was warm. So we sat out on the porch. Uh, it was very uncrowded. There weren't many people there. And we sat down for lunch. And how did the conversation go? Did Mr. Paxton introduce the subject, or did you introduce it, or did somebody else do it? I was not entirely sure why I was there, um, but it became very clear, Nate Paul, uh, in the moment we sat down. Objection, non-responsive. I'll, 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 I'll go, I'll take care of it. Thank you, Chad. If it's okay, I'll just so continue. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> who was the first person to speak, if you recall? Nate Paul did almost all of the talking. Did the Attorney General do any kind of introduction or anything? What was his role in this conversation? It was nothing more than, Ryan, this is Nate Paul, and there are some things he'd like you to hear. That was effectively the upshot of it. There were some things, he said, he said what? I'm paraphrasing now, but yeah. it was to the effect of, this is Nate Paul, and he has some things to share with you. So then what did Mr. Paul do? He proceeded to lay out his theory of the case. Objection, on, hearsay. He's talking about a statement by Nate Paul. Sustained. Did the Attorney General during this entire conversation reject anything that Mr. Paul was saying? No. Did the Attorney General of the State of Texas do anything to show that he did not agree with the things that Mr. Paul was saying? No. So once again, this conversation with Mr. Paul that was held, had in the presence of the Attorney General. What did Mr. Paul say? Objection, hearsay. Your, Your Honor, the reason for this is, uh, this is all in the presence of the party, the Attorney General, and his silence or his statements are acquiescence in, in adopting the statements of Mr. Paul. That's why I don't believe that it is subject to the hearsay exception. Judge, permission to respond? Respond. There is no evidence that this witness can talk about that Mr. Paxton has adopted any statements made by Mr. Paul during that conversation. And because of that, it is not a statement that is adopted by a party opponent, and for that reason, it's still hearsay. Any statement by Nate Paul is hearsay at that, at that meeting. Overall, continue. Thank you. What did he say? Mr. Paul laid out his theory of grievances against the Mitty Foundation. Uh, he described to me how unfair it was that a charity that was a limited investor would be able to assume control over assets that were owned by world class. Uh, he was very vehemently uh, opposed to the receivership. Uh, he, as I recall, was more or less railing on the way that Ray Chester and the Council for Mitty Foundation had handled the case. and more or less went through a number of different complaints that had been raised in a memorandum that had been provided to me by his sister, Sheena Paul. I think it'll be coming clear in later, later uh, testimony from others, but Sheena Paul uh, is a lawyer, is that correct? Yes. And she's the sister of Mr. Nate Paul, is That's that correct? correct. And but your familiarity with the case, that she'd been actively involved in the litigation on behalf of her brother? I don't know how actively involved she was. My impression was she was involved as general in-house in counsel for world class, yes. All right, fair enough. How long did this, this, uh, this description of his complaints and his position with Mr. by Mr. Paul, how long did that last? Oh, the lunch lasted for a good 30, 35 minutes, if not 40. Did, you folks, have, range. did you folks have food? Uh, we did order food. Um, I don't think I ate very much. Did the Attorney General during this meeting ever reject or try to modify or ask questions or do anything during the time that Mr. Paul was pleading his case to you? He did not, no. How did the luncheon end? Mr. Paul completed his uh, exposition and that was a signal for the lunch to end. Did you ask any questions? 
I may have asked a few questions, I don't recall, uh, but it was, it very much had the feeling that I had been summoned to a lunch. Objection non-responsive. Excuse me. I don't know whether it was or not. I, I don't know what the answer Sustain was. Sustain the objection, rephrase, please. Thank you. What was your impression about that, what that whole meeting was about? The strong impression that I had developed was I had been summoned to that lunch by Nate Paul to hear out his grievances and to convince me to get on board with the Midi Foundation intervention program. So how did it, once it ended, uh, what did y'all do? Uh, we parted ways, drove back, got back in the Attorney General's car and came back to the office. Did the Attorney General say anything to you about the case after y'all left Mr. Paul at his office? Very little. Did y'all just sort of sit there silently? I, as I recall, it was a very quiet ride back, yes. And was Mr. Wicker present for this whole conversation? He was, yes. Uh, did you talk to Mr. Wicker about that after you came back? I did. All right. And did you, your, you yourself express yourself as to what you thought about the lunch? Yes, I did. What did you say? Objection hearsay. This man is here. It's not hearsay. A statement it's, by the witness, Your Honor, is not. Overall. Thank you. What did you say? I told him, Drew, that was one of the craziest things I've ever seen. His response? He Objection hearsay. Okay, thank you. Sustained. Right. Thank you, Thank you, Your Honor. We'll move on. Now, um, let me, uh, how old were you at that time of that conversation? How old, was How old were you in the summer of 2020? I was 42 or 43. I'm trying to do the math in my head. 42, I believe. How long had you been a lawyer? I had been a lawyer since, oh, for about 15. Well, I think I was 43 now that you mention it because I'm doing the math. I was 43. And I had been a lawyer for the better part of 15 years at least. Had you ever in 15 years as a lawyer experienced anything like that? Objection of relevance and an improper opinion, Judge. I'm just asking him if he's experienced he ever had anything similar as a lawyer. Overruled. Continue. Go ahead. It was, as we say in the Latin, sui generis. It was one of a kind. I'd never seen anything like it. All right. Now, I can, if, um, by the way, uh, there is one fact I want to try to uh, move on to another subject. But... At this time that y'all are spending this time dealing with Mr. Paul's issues, what all is going on in the Attorney General's office as far as real work that you guys and women were responsible for doing? What, what's happening on the landscape in the state of Texas and in the Attorney General's office that y'all wanted to be working on? We were working around the clock on COVID-related issues, and we were also preparing a major multi-state lawsuit against Google. And is that Google lawsuit still pending? As far as I know, it is. But has it since been given to an outside law firm? Yes. At the time you were there, was it being handled in-house or by an outside law firm? In-house. Right. Did it remain being handled inside, uh, inside the firm, inside the agency, excuse me, until uh, after all of you resigned or were fired? Objection. This witness doesn't have personal knowledge of that. Let me put it this way. Of the people that left on the, on the top floor that were all terminated ultimately, the eight, what, we, what people have called colloquially the eight whistleblowers, was Google ultimately farmed out to a private law firm after all of y'all were gone? Objection hearsay, objection lack of personal knowledge. The hearsay is overruled. A, thank you. I um, believe more than one law firm, yes. Pardon me? I believe more than one, yes, outside right. firms. Now, if you, the microphone, I can't tell, I don't know whether it's being picked up behind me, so if you could just, maybe, if it's louder to me, then maybe it'll be louder back there, okay? Um, in, in addition to Google, were there other major pieces of litigation going on that you were responsible for? Yes, there were. What? The special litigation unit was very busy handling a number of election-related lawsuits. All right. And were there other areas? Were there, what was, what was y'all's experience or involvement at that time in trying to cope with COVID-related legal issues? We had a section called the Disaster Council Advice, a section under the General Counsel 
that was handling a flood of requests from local officials as to how to handle uh, COVID. Well, when the Attorney General kept raising Nate Paul issues of the ones that we've gone through so far and later in the future, do you have any idea of what kind of, how much time or resources that were devoted to dealing with Nate Paul instead of real concerns? We were devoting far more resources to Nate Paul than we ever should have given the importance of those issues. Do, can you put any kind of quantifying amount on it as you sit there? Well, certainly the opinion that we discussed yesterday consumed the better part of three days of my time that could have been spent working on other matters. And of course, the Mitty Foundation consumed a lot more time than that. Now, I want to ask you if I can, and then of course we haven't gotten to whatever time was expended on the hiring of a special of somebody purportedly being a special prosecutor. In other words, the hiring of an outside counsel. We haven't even discussed objection that. Objection to attorney testifying. Excuse me, let me finish my question, please. Judge, my objection please. is to his, the call of his counsel. Counsel, let him finish. Yes, Judge. And then you can object. Mr. Harden, you can finish your question. Thank you. Do you have any idea how much more time and resources were devoted to once the, you discovered this issue of an of a, a, uh, outside counsel being considered and then being done? It was many, many hours. Uh, we spent days dealing with the fallout of that, and that was all of us together. So seven, eight of us at least, plus support, a few support staff. So it would be hundreds of man hours. All right, now, uh, Mr. Bangert, I want to go uh, to, you mentioned the, what some of us colloquially have called the midnight opinion. Um, can you tell us, without a, 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 you know, not necessarily a long legal description, is there a section in the government code that deals with these opinions? There are, there is a very distinct section in the government code that deals with our authority to issue opinions, yes. All right. So when we talk about opinions, very briefly, that come out of, of the Attorney General's office, how many types of opinions would you say there are involved? There are two types, there are a handful of types of opinions involved. The first would be an opinion issued pursuant to our uh, government code 402 authority to issue opinions to individuals who are authorized requesters. All right, let me stop there. So uh, section 402 of the government code authorizes you to produce opinions in response to whom? Very specific individuals, they have to, there's a list in the code, uh, legislative, uh, chairman of legislative committees are one, certain statewide officials, there are a handful I believe of local government officials who would be authorized, but it's a very distinct list and that list cannot be waived. And, and is there any distinction in the government code between an informal and a formal opinion? No. Um, do you recall whether or not in the opinion that y'all wrote for, at the Attorney General's request, do you recall any language at the end of it that talked about it was an informal opinion guidance? Can I put up, uh, do we have an exhibit number for, um, can I step over there just to get an exhibit number, please? Yes, sir. Thank you. And we've been listening to continued testimony under direct examination of Ryan Bangert. He is the former number two uh, aide in the Texas Attorney General's office being questioned there by state uh, House impeachment prosecutor Rusty Stacey, Harden. can I ask you to put up uh, Exhibit it 115? It appears they found there. the exhibit they were looking for. Let's listen back in to the testimony. And can we go to the end of that opinion, please? But well, first of all, do you recognize- Counselor, has this already on the list of admitted evidence? This has already it been admitted. It has been, okay. Yes, this, this is one that's agreed. Thank you, Your Honor. But do you recognize this exhibit? I do. 
And what is it? The first page, this is the opinion that we worked on and issued uh, August 1st in response to the Attorney General's request concerning foreclosures. All right, and this is the opinion you've talked about earlier that was completed at about one o'clock in the morning on that Sunday? It is. All right, now if you would, uh, Stacy, would you scroll to sort of the end of the opinion? Now, could you explain to us, I believe you just testified there's not a difference, there's not a distinction in the code between informal and formal? And Judge, I'd object that that is an improper legal conclusion by this witness. What? I'm Overruled. Sorry. Thank you. Um, this opinion that you drafted, and this is actually an opinion that you signed, correct? Yes. And was this division and this matter under your supervision and control? It had been. All right. Before you became the deputy first assistant, is that what you mean? Yes. Okay. All right. So the language says, I'm trying to stay with the microphone to be able to read. It says, please note, this letter is not a formal attorney general opinion under section 402-042 of the Texas government code. Rather, it is intended only to convey informal legal guidance. Explain to me what the significance of that, and, and is, is that inconsistent with your previous testimony? No, it is not. All right, explain, please. Well, I would analogize this to the practice in Texas courts of issuing published and unpublished opinions. Uh, we have an obligation under 402 045, which is part of the opinions uh, authority, only to issue opinions to individuals uh, if they are authorized requesters. They have, you cannot simply issue opinions as the Attorney General's office to any individual who asks because we are not a private law firm. We so serve walk, the interests of the state. So if I walk in off the street or have something in my business or so that I really want an opinion for, am I entitled to ask the Attorney General's office to, to get Give me an opinion, just to give me the legal advice? No, not unless you're one of the listed statutory requesters. Is a legislator one of those people that is authorized to ask? Chairman, yes. All right. And is, oh, it has to be a chairman of a committee? Yes. And, and in this case, as we've talked about yesterday, that's what happened, correct? Yes, I believe Senator Hughes at this time was chair of the State Affairs Committee and possibly one other. All right. Now. There was there a time in the history of the Attorney General's office in which the office did issue informal opinions? The, my recollection was that yes, there was a time when we would post opinions on our website that were informal in nature. All right, and, and are you aware that the, the, your website, their website now, the Attorney General's website now, indicates that that stopped in 1979. Is that anywhere consistent with your understanding? That would not surprise me. All right. Now, go here to explain to me why you put this language in here then that said... It's not a formal attorney general opinion. It is, it is rather it is intended only to convey informal legal guidance. Explain why that's okay, or why you put it there either. Yes. The normal opinions process involves going through the opinion committee. It's a very rigorous process of drafting, review, approval. It goes up through a number of different layers of review. This did not follow that normal process. It did not go out for briefing for third parties to evaluate and consider whether they wanted to brief on this. So none of those procedural aspects were associated with this opinion, nor did it receive a, what we call a KP number, which is a formal opinion assignment number for publication on the website and ultimately publication on Westlaw. Well, as far as the statute is concerned, is there a distinction by what you did, or did on this opinion that night? Any different, is that opinion and its consequences any different than a, in terms of its effect on the outside world. Objection. It, excuse me, let me finish my question. As a, oh, it, I'm just, if I remember what it was, let me start over. Um, is there 
any difference on the impact on the outside world of what you did here in this particular opinion and what an opinion that you might have issued that went through the formal process that you say takes up to six months or so? No, all of our opinions have persuasive value. Improper legal opinion. Overall, continue. Why did you say that then? This signaled to the reader that this opinion had not gone through the formal rigorous process of review by the opinion committee. It had not gone out for briefing. It had not gone through the normal process that can take up to 180 days of time. And it was also not going to be receiving a KP number. Uh, and I don't believe this is published on Westlaw. I haven't checked, but I would be surprised if it were. So why did the two of you decide to do it this way, to put that sentence in there? Would you ordinarily have put that sentence in a, an opinion where, say, another chairman of another committee asked for it, et cetera? Would you have ordinarily put this sentence in there? We would not put this sentence in an opinion that went through the normal, formal process. There were other opinions that contained this language, but all of them had similar characteristics. They were requested by uh, someone who was an authorized requester, and they did not go through the formal process. And does that not going through the formal process, and you're communicating that to outside world, is there a reason you do that? Yeah, this signals that it did not receive the rigorous review that an opinion of our office normally would. So if lawyers in court are contesting, uh, 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 having a controversial issue, and their opposing side sought to introduce this. Is that sort of a signal to anybody that knew about the process that they might have an argument to the judge? Wait a minute, this is, this is not, there's no such thing, may not be such a thing as an informal opinion judge, but this opinion did not go through the rigorous process a normal opinion did. Would that argument be available to them? I presume it would be. Certainly our intent was to signal this had not gone through the formal process. All right. I notice your eyebrows go up when you're thinking. Does that mean that you never had thought about it before I just asked this? Oh, no. No, this is, uh, this is something that we were dealing with in mass. Section non-responsive. There wasn't a question asked. Okay. So were, you having these kind of, excuse me, were you having these kind of questions all the time? Or not all the time. Let me put it another way. Were you frequently having to deal with this kind of issue? At this time this specific moment, we were dealing with an unusual influx of requests for advice. And was there a process in which you could provide, uh, are there other ways that you could provide, other than just this? Could you do things in another way, like press releases or things like that? Certainly, if we're not providing legal advice to an individual, we can send out press statements, we can send out uh, bulletins or announcements, uh, I don't see anything that would preclude us from doing this, but the code 402.045 is very clear that if we're providing advice to an individual, then that individual must be an authorized requester for the purpose of ensuring that the interests of the state are being represented by that request. Are you aware, one way or the other, of whether opinions like this might be used by litigants in private litigation? I assume they are because that's why they are Objection, posted on West speculation. Line. This witness was not there I, for the litigants. I, I would, Overall. I, Your Honor, I'm going to ask if the court might I'd say this nicely. Instruct counsel when he has an objection to wait until the answer is completed and then he can object and ask for some, if, if the court sustains it, he can ask for other things. But this constant interrupting the witness in the middle of the statement or the questioner in the middle of the statement is unduly time consuming. Your Honor. May I respond to that? Yes. I have to object if the witness is testifying to things that shouldn't be admissible into evidence. I shouldn't have to wait for him to say hearsay before I make that objection. And so yes. I would request to wait till Mr. Harden finishes his question and then lodge my objection. If you're talking over each other, the court reporters can't report accurately what either of you are saying and the jurors can't hear what you are saying. So I understand, Counselor, but try to not talk over each other. Yes, Judge. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, there, real quickly, we're about through with this, this issue, but I, I want to know if there are other ways 
that y'all chose to inform people. For instance, if mayors, uh, what was your experience during this period of time? If mayors of cities or local government spokespersons or officers uh, were contacting you for legal guidance, how did you approach those kind of issues in dealing with COVID? Yes. The legislature had granted our office authority under Section 418 to respond to requests for legal advice from certain local officials, mayors are one of them, uh, for issues related to a declared disaster in their jurisdiction. Uh, that code was passed, my understanding, in response to hurricane disasters. We, no one anticipated every single county in the state of Texas being placed under a simultaneous disaster declaration in response to COVID, but so it was. So we effectively became available to officials in 254 counties throughout the state of Texas under 418. Do you have any knowledge one way or the other through discussions and, and activities in the Attorney General's office as to whether or not the Attorney General had indicated he was aware of other possible ways to address someone's concern about a gathering uh, other than Section 402? Unless there was an authorized requester under 418, no. All right, thank you. Now, at the, at the end of the day, once this process was completed, was there any distinction in whatever, however it would be considered by others in this opinion and the opinion that went through the very rigorous six months of uh, research and, and uh, consultation? The effect is the same. They have persuasive value uh, based on the solidness of the reasoning and based on the fact that it's issued by the Attorney General's office. It's the persuasive value of the opinion that, uh, that follows it. Thank you. Now, at the, at, when we can, I want to go to... <clears throat> One final question. Is an opinion under this Section 402 that you issued is it considered just as authoritative, though, in terms of its results? Is an opinion that goes through the rigorous examination that you described? There's no reason it would not. Okay. Now, would it have the same ability and the same impact if one wanted to seek to use it in litigation? Again, the reader would evaluate it for its persuasive value, just like a formal opinion. All right. Now, I, I want to move, if I may, sir, um, to... What happens, starting in, um, in your experience, when did you become, a, uh, with the uh, outside counsel, when did you become aware that the lieutenant governor wanted to appoint outside counsel? Senator, uh, counselor, I almost called you senator, so we're even. You know, I've done it again. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be forced to hold you in contempt soon, Harry. I, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm just thankful I didn't put a name to it. <laughs> so am I. So go ahead. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me start again. Um, <laughs> when did you first become aware that the Attorney General uh, was interested in, um, and, and concerned and wanted an outside lawyer hired to deal with an investigation of Mr. Paul, uh, Mr. Paul's complaints? Action leading. I don't want Overruled. It would have been sometime in August or September that I learned about the outside counsel request. All right, there we have seen uh, one that would, talks about the matrix that a, a, such a request would have to go through. Were you aware that Mr. Vassar had drafted a contract uh, at the request of the Attorney General's office uh, before, and if so, when did you become aware of that? I was aware of that, yes. And, and had you taken a position about whether or not to hire an outside counsel? With the Attorney General, and no. your microphone. I, I had not, but I obviously in conversations, I should say obviously, in conversations with other senior staff, we were very much in agreement Objection this is not a hearsay. proper... Objection to hearsay. He hasn't... See, that's the problem with doing it. Yeah. He, has, he did not talk about what they said. He did not talk about any statement. 
And this interruption of the question keeps it from being clear as to what he was going to say. That's my concern. Overruled. Thank you. So, and the question was your position. Improper. All right. And do you recall when's the first time you told the Attorney General that yourself? I did not have occasion to speak with him about this as it was outside my line of authority. All right. So if your opposition that you thought you were opposed to it, would that have been communicated to others rather than the Attorney General? Objection yes. hearsay. I'm sorry, what was the answer? I'm objecting and I would ask for a ruling, you're, Judge. Counsel, you're talking over him that I can't even okay. distinguish what you're objecting to, what he said or what he said. So let's start over on that question. Sure. Thank you, Judge. Um, were your conversations, without going into what they were, about this subject with other people rather than the Attorney General? Yes. Objection. Okay. Overruled. Yes. Thank you. Uh, now, at the end of the, when did you, when did this, from your perspective, when did this issue boil over? When you say boil over, uh, could you be more specific? Yeah, if you could, if you could, again, I, I, it sounded to me like you moved away from the microphone a little bit. Mr. Just Banger, keep, you could speak a little louder, I think. Yeah, Just that's... Speak I up think, a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. I didn't know that moved. Okay. I think I might have broken it, so All right. hopefully not. So, don't mess with the base of it very much or we can both get in trouble. Um, so, uh, when did, when I, I used the phrase boil over, let me ask you, explain what I mean in my question. What I mean is, when did this become a, an issue of concern to more than just one person in the criminal justice division that you became aware of? What time frame is all I'm asking you? Increasingly through August and into September, it became an issue of very urgent concern for me, as well as for others on the senior leadership team. All right. Now, tell me what it was, in fact, when, when, when did this issue first surface, and what manner did it surface that gave you concern? When you say the matter, it would be with regards to Nate Paul? Yes. My concerns had been growing exponentially over the nine to 10 month period that we were dealing with matters related to Nate Paul. Uh, it began when the opinion request, when we were asked, when I was asked to intervene and work with the open records requests, uh, it was uncharacteristic. It continued and was heightened when I was asked to work on the MIDI Foundation project. I was exceptionally concerned after the opinion was issued because I felt there had been a, a break in trust at that point. And of course, when we learned that, when I became aware that the Attorney General is now pressing for criminal investigation of individuals in the community based on allegations that all of us believe, and I certainly believed, were frivolous at best, I was exceptionally concerned. Now, without going into what other people told you at the time in a specific conversation, did you become aware of generally the subject area or so that the Attorney General was seeking to hide outside counsel to investigate? Yes, it involved the law enforcement action concerning Nate Paul and his properties. He was concerned that he, again, this was his same mantra over and over again. When you say he, are you talking about the Attorney General? Well, Nate Paul, and in connection with the Attorney General, arguing that law enforcement had been wronging Nate Paul, had been oppressing Nate Paul, and had been treating him unlawfully. There was no evidence that I had seen whatsoever to substantiate uh any of that. Of Judge, I would object to that. It's an improper opinion. It's speculation. And this witness doesn't have personal knowledge of Nate Paul's opinions or feelings at that time. He's, just, he's expressing his opinion of what gave him concern on an evolutionary or evolving way, Your Honor. With Counselor, I think he's expressing his opinion, so overruled. Yes, Judge. Now, when exactly uh, did you start getting involved in expressing your position and taking your position on this matter? 
we were discussing it actively throughout the month of September. All right. Now, uh, at the time, it, were you aware one way or the other that Mr. Penley was refusing to sign the contract that was being that had been drafted by Mr. Vassar to retain Mr. Kamek? Yes. Um, though you had, it had not made its way to you, had you seen the contract that was proposed? I do not recall, although it, I had certainly discussed it with others. Did you, in fact, uh, uh, take any position in these meetings, you yourself, of senior staff, on the advisability of hiring Mr. Kamek to go investigate multiple public law enforcement persons, did you? Yes. And what, did, what were you saying? What was your position? Objection, hearsay. It is not hearsay. There is no hearsay for the witness. Overall, the counselor, he's asking him for his opinion. Okay. What was your position? There was no basis or justification for it. It would not serve the public interest. Uh, and if you had to describe the opinion of about, about how many of you were involved in this issue at the senior level? Jeff Mateer, I was aware of it. David Maxwell, Mark Penley. I am fairly, oh, Ryan Vassar, obviously. Um, Lacey Mays, because she was working with Mr. Vassar. And Blake Brickman, as policy, would have been involved as well. By the way, you've essentially named the group of eight whistleblowers, have you not? I don't believe I named Darren McCarty. All right, and was he one of those that was also concerned? He was, although his focus was primarily civil. All right. Now, I don't think I asked. Maybe if I did, I'd want to be clear. Have you sued in this case? I have not sued the Attorney General, no. And so as we look and listen to people in this testimony, Mr. Mateer and you both, neither one of you have sued or sought any damages or compensation. Is that correct? I have not sued, and I am aware that Mr. Mateer has not either. All right. Now, when uh, you, you've, how, did, how did this thing come to crescendo, if it did? When you talk about the first week in September, what events were you aware of that, that affected what happened at the end of September? I was in Atlanta, Georgia at a conference with Mr. Mateer. We were about to join a significant telephone call with our multi-state partners to discuss the Google litigation that was planned. The call was set to begin. Uh, it was a very important call for coalition building purposes. Mr. Mateer received a telephone call. It was from the Attorney General. And I was witness to Mr. Mateer's side of the call. The call had nothing to do with Google. It was all about Nate Paul. And at that time, how big an issue and um, a matter and piece of litigation was the Google case in the Attorney General's office? It was consuming substantial resources and was a major initiative of the Attorney General's office. And it was, yes. Were you, did you two inform the Attorney General you were about to go into an important meeting on Google? Yes. What did you say? Uh, Mr. Mateer was the one communicating directly with the Attorney General, but something to the effect of, do we have to do this now, because we're about to have this Google conversation. What was the Attorney General's response? I could not hear his response, but the phone call continued for some time, so I have to assume his response objection was, yes, we have to. Right, his, his, his objection is to you assuming, and I, I agree with that. They don't assume what happened, uh, but as a result, even though, though the Attorney General was told that you were about to be involved in a meeting on a very major piece of civil litigation, did he terminate the call to talk later? No, objection, it continued for objection some time. To speculation, he couldn't hear Ken Paxton on the phone. Counselor, asked he asked I, if he terminated the call. Yeah, Continue. Thank you. Overruled. Thank you. Now, this conversation that lasted, were you part of it in terms of being able to respond and hear the Attorney General? I could not hear the Attorney General, nor could I respond to him. Could you hear the conversation in response by Mr. Mateer? Yes. And the conversation lasted again about how long? We went right up to the bell. We were almost late for the Google call. Google call. It probably took about 10 minutes. 
Your Honor, I, I would urge that this conversation, which was happening between the two of them, is actually not hearsay in the sense the, the content of what the Attorney General was saying, or what Mr. Mateer was saying, rather, not offered for the truth of the matter of what he was saying about Nate Paul, but only that that's what he was telling these folks. And so uh, I would like to tender conversations as to what he was having with Mr. Mateer as they were talking. Hold on a second, Counselor. Sure. Was there an I don't think there was an objection. You were starting this line of questioning. I only because I didn't I didn't want to speak over anybody, but I am objecting to this line of questioning, and I do have a response if the court would care to hear it. What is your response? Well, that Mr. Banger has already testified that he could not hear Ken Paxson on the other phone on the other side of that phone call, so he can't testify to this court that he's adopted any of the statements made by Mr. Mateer. Um, Mr. Harden wants to submit Mr. Mateer's testimony. That's not made in court. That's hearsay. If, if I may, uh, may I ask counsel, I didn't hear the, understand the first part of it when he characterized what the testimony was. The objections here say, Judge. Well, I understand that, but when he, when he characterized what Mr. Mateer's testimony was, I just ask him to repeat what he said there, because I just didn't get it. That's all sure. I'm saying. What I said was that Mr. Banger has already testified to you and the jury, Your Honor, that he could not hear what Ken Paxton was saying on the other side of that phone call. And so there is no evidence that he adopted anything that Mr. Mateer said, and so they're not his statements, and it still amounts to he whatever Jeff Mateer said is still hearsay. I'm, I'm sorry, we'd have to go back on the record. That's not my memory of Mr. Mateer's testimony. That's why I wanted to ask him to repeat it. I, I'm I don't, asking, I don't okay. think they talked for 15 minutes with Mr. Mateer not being able to hear him. I'm gonna overrule, be careful you. As, you, as you move forward. So this conversation, it was, did Mr. Mateer give any indication he couldn't hear the Attorney General? I, it became clear to me by listening to the conversation, it was about Nate Paul, and in particular, this Ob question about retaining outside counsel. Objection to hearsay. Judge, may I be heard? No, wait a minute. We just went through that. He just ruled on this matter. I've already ruled, overruled, continue. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. It was concerning the hiring of outside counsel to investigate these allegations that Nate Paul had brought to our office. Can you put a date on it? The best I can recall, the conference took place a week, maybe a week and a half prior to the end of September. Was there anything in this conversation, as you heard from the other end, about uh, him being disturbed that Mr. Pendley would not, dis would not sign the contract? Obje objection. The question calls for hearsay. He's asking what Jeff Mateer said on the phone call. I believe the court's already ruled on this. I'm simply asking him about the conversation. I've already ruled on this, Counselor. Judge. Go ahead, sir. Mr. Paxton was frustrated that we were not moving forward with the retention of outside counsel. Objection to speculation. And he, he didn't hear Mr. Paxton on the phone call. His opinion of what Mr. Paxton the, the, thought is improper. The court has just ruled three times on this issue. My, rule, my objection was different, Your Honor. Overall. Now, at the end of the conversation, that during the course of this conversation, was there were the people that for the meeting at Google having to wait till the General Paxton finished trying to get you to approve an investigation by Mr. Cameron? I know we went right up to the wire. We may have gone a few minutes past it. I don't recall, but it was close and it might have gone over. Well, I'm wondering is at the end of the conversation, did you have any new instructions as to what the two of y'all were to do about Mr. Cameron? I did not receive any instructions myself. All right. As a result of that conversation, did you do anything new or express any new concern about the hiring of Mr. Kamek? I did nothing new. 
Our concern, my concern, was heightened substantially. Objection, non-responsive. Let him finish the answer. Please. Counselor, he's answering the question that was directed. Yes, Judge. Overall. Thank you. My concern, based on that occurrence, was substantially heightened because we were about to move into a very intense phase of the Google litigation, and the Attorney General's focus was on Nate Paul, not on the Google case. So at the end of this conversation, who did you understand that the Attorney General wanted an outside counsel to investigate? The law enforcement action concerning Nate Paul. That would have included the search of his house, his properties. Uh, the theory was that there had been an improper warrant obtained, and I believe there were also allegations of a conspiracy right. by law enforcement. All right. And, and the, did that include investigating federal magistrates? A federal magistrate? Yes. Did it include investigating individual law enforcement officers in the FBI? Yes. Did it include investigating DPS officers? I believe so. I believe and, that's correct. And did you know at that time were there any members of the securities board that were also part of this investigation that he wanted to investigate it? I believe Mr. Saban. And were you aware as to what both the head of your law enforcement division and Mr. Maxwell, because I'm not sure exactly what his title is, were you aware of what their consistent positions have been all along on this matter? Yes. And in spite of that, was the Attorney General still insisting on going and investigating this, these people on behalf of Mr. Paul? Yes. When you returned to, to, uh, to Austin, uh, when was the next time you had any contact with, or were aware of this particular activity? I was in a meeting at the governor's office. I believe it was with Mr. Brickman. We had normal meetings scheduled during that time to respond to COVID. Can you give us a date? I believe this was September 30th. All right. Uh, toward the very end of September. Uh, I received a text message telling me to return to the office that something had happened. Uh, my immediate assumption was that something was Nate Paul. Why? Because we had been becoming increasingly concerned. We felt as if matters were coming to a head. The Attorney General was insisting that we move forward with outside counsel. We strongly resisted that. We, at that point, had become cognizant of the pattern that had developed over the preceding nine months. And it was clear to me that hiring outside counsel to undertake this task could only benefit one person. And I'd object to that opinion. It's an improper opinion. This is opinion, it's counsel. Totally responsible. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Your Sorry. Honor. I said it's his opinion overruled. Yes, Judge. Thank you. Now, um, when you were at the governor's office, uh, had you been aware or made aware yet of a phone call uh, that had been received by any of your other staff the day before involving uh, Mr. Kamek and subpoenas? If you're referring to a phone call received by Ms. Mays from a banker, uh, and I'm only asking, were you aware of that call? I was. The meeting at the governor's office took place on the same day that Ms. Mays received the phone call from the banker. Objection. So if that phone call took place on the 29th, that was the day of the meeting. All right. Objection, non responsive we're, to the question. Counselor overruled. Um, now, when you were at, at the governor's office, was there somebody else with you? From your, your, your staff, was there another member of the Attorney General's office with My you? My recollection was Blake Brickman. All right. And, and were y'all on totally unrelated normal business with the Governor's office? Normal business. All right. So what did you do when you got that text? Excused ourselves from the meeting, and we departed and went back to the office, the Attorney General's office. And where, what, what time that day, on the 30th of September, did you return to the AG's office, and where did you go? We went to the eighth floor and went directly to Mr. Mateer's office. And Mr. Mateer was there, Lacey was there. Uh, I believe others were starting to gather. All right, and, and now would you describe the atmosphere in the room? What, I mean, first of all, how many ultimately ended up in the room talking about this matter? Mr. Maxwell was on vacation. 
but all the other deputies that were involved as the whistleblowers ultimately were there. And what was the atmosphere? Disbelief, shock, extreme concern. What were you most concerned about? What did you learn that would make you most concerned? We had been following this pattern of Nate Paul and his interests metastasizing throughout the agency over a period of months. It had become clear to me, based on my conversations with the Attorney General, based on the lack of any substantiation for many of the claims that were made, based on the absence of a public interest in taking actions Objection to benefit Nate Paul. Based on all of those concerns, I Counselor, was. I'm sorry. I was you have an objection, you. raise an objection, but just interrupting, not helpful. I didn't hear an objection, and I just heard an interruption. I apologize, Judge, but I, I'm just intending to object because I believe that what Mr. Bangert is doing on the stand is not responsive to Mr. That's Harden's question, and I have to lodge my objection so that he doesn't testify before the jury. Counsel, I think he wants you sitting so the rest of us can sorry, hear you. Sorry, I just. I so we see. can hear you. Just Sorry. please sit. We can hear you better. I'm objecting while Mr. Banger is speaking because he's testifying to evidence that I believe is not admissible, and he's telling it before the jury. And so I'm lodging my objection before it gets to the jurors so it doesn't affect inadmissible evidence, doesn't come in and affect their judgment in this case. So I don't mean to speak over Mr. Banger, Your Honor, but I do have to lodge my objection on behalf of Mr. Paxton. I just did not hear the word objection. Okay. And if he objects, the witness, stop talking where you are. Do not continue. Um, I overrule the objection, however. Thank you, Judge. And you were, the question was, I was asking you what your concerns were and why. And I think you were in the process of setting that out. Let me ask you this. Um, in the course of this conversation, uh, first of all, you, of course, were not here for opening statements, were you? No. And you weren't here for the cross-examination of Mr. Mateer? No. If someone was contending that you folks were sitting around involving it in a mutiny, how, what, would your, this, that, what would be your response to the suggestion that you folks were sitting around there cooking up a mutiny against the Attorney General of the State of Texas? As in we were, I, I, that would make no sense to me. We were trying to protect the Attorney General as much as we could. As a matter of fact, over the last nine months, what had been your mission in relation to the Attorney General as it related to, to, to Mr. Paul? We had continually, in various ways, warned him about Mr. Paul. We had discussed with him the absence for any substantiated basis for taking actions to benefit Mr. Paul. We during, have been rebuffed. During all that time, were you still a supporter of the Attorney General? Yes. Did you believe in the things that he was publicly saying that he believed and he wanted to do? Yes, that's why we were there. And, and did you, all that period of time when you were warning him about Nate Paul, were you, what is your testimony in terms of whether or not you still were looking after the best interest of the public, but also the Attorney General. Senior staff always has to walk that line. And our job, we take an oath to defend the Constitution of the state, but we also are loyal to our principal. And those two things, in almost all cases, are consistent with each other. So our job is both to protect the interest of the public and to serve at the pleasure of the Attorney General. And when this meeting is held, by the way, I think you said the 30th, and I, I want to sort of put a couple events in your mind to see whether it's possible that meeting would have been the 29th, for you to let us know whether it's the 29th or 30th. You ultimately called and made an appointment to visit and, and go to the FBI during this time frame, correct? Yes and you were over at the governor's office. And if the evidence is going to be unrebutted that you and your group went to the FBI on the 30th, when would this meeting, would this, what is your testimony as to when this meeting that you've been describing would it, have been? It would have been the day before. The 20, it would have been the day before, the 29th. Okay. So, 
this meeting where you come back over from the, from the governor's office and you all meet together. It was on the 29th of September? Yes. How long uh, had, by this time, had you been informed of what these subpoenas that had been served by Mr. Kamek were asking for? Initially, we were aware of a subpoena to a bank requesting records relating to Nate Paul's financial interests. That was the first one that we became aware of. Did we you, subsequently became aware of others. Did you become aware that these subpoenas were actually seeking information through the grand jury, a criminal state grand jury, of Mr. Paul's opponents in his civil litigation? Yes. Objection leading. My objection is that the question is leading, Judge. I'll put it another way, Your Honor, real Dane, quickly. please rephrase. Were you aware of one way or the other? And if so, what were you aware of in terms of whether these, the subpoenas of Mr. Kamek were being used and drafted to help Mr. Paul in his civil litigation? Yes, it became, as the subpoenas began to roll in and we became aware of them, reading them, they were consistent with his argument that he wanted to pursue action against both the law enforcement officials who had pursued the, uh, su pursued the subpoenas of his house and his properties, as well as financial interests related to Mitty Foundation, and I believe others. Now, at this time, when this is all happening, what, what was, was there sort of a mood of control? When you talked about shock, what were you, why were you shocked? What were you concerned about? We were unaware, at least I was unaware, that Mr. Kamek had been taking any action on behalf of our office. I was unaware that he had been retained. I was deeply concerned that the name and authority and power of our office had been, in my view, hijacked to serve the interests of an individual against the interest of the broader public. And the fact that he had invoked the use of a grand jury to try to help in the, Mr. Paul in his investigation, what level of concern and why was that a bother to you? It was unconscionable in my view. You were using criminal process to pursue the private enemies. Objection. I'm objecting to improper opinion about the unconscionability of these actions. I asked why he was concerned. Overruled. Thank you. You can pick back up. Yes, in my view, the criminal process had been harnessed to pursue the business enemies of an individual, Nate Paul, who also happened to be under intensive investigation by law enforcement. So how, how did you folks decide? I think it was, it was seven, was it seven guys and one woman? I mean, so I'm, when I'm talking about guys or women or whatever, how did y'all decide? I mean, what kind of considerations did you give as to courses of action you should follow? I'll speak for myself here. That's all, that's all I want you to do. As a staffer, you have fidelity to the Constitution and fidelity to your principal. Those two things should always align. Unfortunately, over the previous nine months, they had been drifting further and further apart. One always assumes the best about their principal and attempts to protect that principal's interests, even at your own expense. When I saw that the subpoenas had been issued outside of the normal process of our office, to pursue criminal process against private citizens to benefit one individual, it became clear to me that there was nothing more I could do, that the office, the Attorney General was determined to harness the power of our office and to fulfill the interests of a single individual against the interest of the state. And Judge, I would object to that answer. That answer is speculation about his opinion of what the intent was of other parties. Overruled. Now, did y'all try to decide what to do in terms of whether you hire outside lawyers yourself? Or what, what kind of issues were you concerned about as a, a course of action going forward, you yourself? We had stepped into the void at that point. There's nothing, there's no roadmap to follow. 
when that happens. It's sort of like what we're doing here, right? Yes. There's no real roadmap except for something 100 years ago and something in the 70s. You were writing on a clean slate, weren't you? Yes, much against our will, but our hand had been forced. So what drove you to make the decision to go to law enforcement? In my view, there was simply nothing more we could do. It had, the course of actions had played themselves out. The Attorney General was determined to follow this course of action in favor of Nate Paul, despite all of our efforts to persuade him otherwise. The power of our office had been fully, at that point, harnessed to advance Nate Paul's interests, and we had lost the ability to, as senior staff, protect our principal. Mr. Banger, um, there's been suggestions repeatedly in this proceeding that why didn't you just go to the, to, to the uh, Attorney General? Um, why didn't you go to the Attorney General just talk to him? Did you? Concerns were raised repeatedly and consistently by multiple members of senior staff over a course of several months. There is no question in my mind, based on my personal experience with him, that he was well aware of our objections. And, and in fact, after you went to the FBI, on the 30th of September, on the 1st of October, did you as a group send a, a text message to the Attorney General asking to meet with him? We did. And, and before that, had you been aware that he was out of town when all of this happened to begin with? Yes. And when I say to begin with, on the period of September the 28th, 29th, uh, do you know where the Attorney General was? He was on a business trip out of the state. I don't recall which state he was in, but he was out of state. And on the 29th or 30th, uh, were you, what, would, what, was the 30, what was the hurry that you experienced about trying to call this to the attention of law enforcement? Were you concerned what Mr. Kamek was still serving subpoenas out there to private people? Or what did you, what was your concern? My Jackson concern. Meeting. About Kamek, he's insinuating the answer in the question, Judge. I asked what his concern was. Okay. Overruled. My concern was we did not know what we did not know. We knew that he had already been serving subpoenas on banks. We were learning of additional subpoenas. We... In my view, we had lost our ability to speak into the situation as senior staff. We had no ability to end the use of our office to advance private personal interests, using, improperly using the criminal process. The only way we could deal with that situation was to make a report to the FBI. At least that was our judgment at the time. Do you happen to recall why you picked the FBI rather than some other agency? My recollection was that we had a relationship with some agents at the FBI who we trusted and we knew, and also the FBI, in our view, would have jurisdiction over these kinds of matters. In addition, DPS at that time was one of the people, one of the groups, was it not, that Mr. Paul was seeking to, to investigate? Yes. Um, at, at the end of the day, um, how long did you, did, when y'all decided to go to the FBI, how many of you went and how long were the interviews? Seven of us went, we were interviewed together. All right, and how long do you think the interview? Multiple hours. And once, it, once that interview was over, I mean, did you go yourself knowing one way or the other what type of crime might or might not be involved? I did not have the precise I, I had a fairly good idea what was happening based on the evidence I had collected, yes. But did you, one way or the other, as a, non, a person not experienced in criminal law, did y'all sit down and decide what statute it was or anything like that? Objection to improper opinion about what kind of crime this witness believes was committed. That's fine. I'll withdraw that question. Um, Sustained. Thank you, Your Honor. Let me ask you this. Did you consider what he had been doing on behalf of, of Nate Paul an abusive office? Yes. Objection to improper opinion and invades the province of this jury's decision in this case. Let me put it in, 
Sustained. It, they put it another way. Councillor, try a little bit better. Thank you, Your Honor. Did you yourself, when you went to the FBI, have an opinion that drove you to the FBI about whether what this conduct by the Attorney General did, that was, the Attorney General was involved in, as to whether or not he was violating the oath of office that you were familiar with and believed he should be following? Objection to that question. Again, same objection, Judge. Overall. Yes. And what did you think? You person, just you personally. Objection and improper opinion about uh, in relevance to what this witness thought. Overruled. I went to the FBI because I believed that the attorney general. Just put the microphone up or move forward, but just move up a little bit if you don't mind. I went to the FBI because I believed, based on my experience over the previous nine months, that the attorney general had abandoned his obligation to work on behalf of the interests of the people of Texas to serve the interests of one person, Nate Paul. And that was based on a series of events that occurred over several months. Objection to non-responsive. He asked his opinion, not what he based it off of. Sustained. Now, after you folks went to the FBI, were you all together when you, and you sent an email uh, the next day to the attorney general wanting to meet with him? We did. What was the Attorney General's response? It was a very odd response. What it was, was it? It was a text message saying that he would be happy to meet with us to address any concerns we may have or something to that effect. But then did he agree to? No, did we did not meet with him. Did, how did that go? Did you know whether, <clears throat> whether he was able to meet? Can I have the... Two exhibits. May, may have just a moment for Stacy. May have just real quick. Sure, Councilor. We're at our our break time. Do you want to? I don't know how much longer you have with this witness. I think only five or ten minutes is all I have left with this witness. Okay, we'll go about another ten minutes. Thank you. We're continuing to monitor testimony of Ryan Bangert. He is the former deputy, former deputy first assistant. Thank you, Ashley. Yes, yes, absolutely. I was also trying to listen to what was happening there. Um, we've got a break coming up in about 10 more minutes, but Rusty Harden saying he's got about uh, 10 more minutes of questioning. Let's go back to the Capitol. And explain to the jury, if you can see it clearly on the screen, Yes, I see the document. All right. Do you recognize this document in this exchange of, of text messages? It's been a while, but I, I recognize it. All right. What I'm going to ask you to do, each, each text message identifies the sender. I'm going to ask you to publish this to the jury and the public, but keeping your voice up, it's a, it's a trick because you've got to look in there. First of all, if you would, just start out with Mr. Mateer, identify the speaker. And, the, and publish this exhibit to the public. Yes, the text message is dated September 29th, 2020. It begins at 3.02 p.m. The first text message is from Jeff Mateer to a group of us on a group text. Quote, we have a major problem. The kid has served a subpoena on a bank, showed up there in person at the bank. Jeff then sends a separate text with someone from World Class, and then he did sends. You later discover, excuse me, sir, did you later discover the person with him? Michael Wynn. was Michael Wynn, Nate Paul's lawyer. Yes, Michael Wynn. So you you have him out there serving subpoenas with the lawyer of the person that's asked for the investigation, correct? That is correct. Who you know is under federal investigation as as you're going along. That is correct. Go ahead. The next text from Jeff. I need you guys to come back. All right. 
Then let's go to the next time and and so. Same day, September 29th, 2020, 9.05 p.m. Jeff Mateer writing to the group from Maxwell. And what does that, do you have any idea what that's referring to? Do you remember? I believe Maxwell had been communicating with us at that time about the events of the day and had provided his evaluation as to a letter that we had been writing. And he was actually in Colorado on vacation, was he He was vacationing. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Then Jeff pastes in this, this language, read the letter, not sufficient. A request letter must allege specific allegations that are in violation of state law to include documentation of criminal act. The only thing you have is what happened today that is documented. And what letter are, there, are you talking about there? Or is he talking, yeah, that you're talking about, do you recall? My recollection is that there was a letter that had begun to be circulated amongst senior staff, but I'm, I am reaching into my memory to recall this specific time frame. Were you at that time drafting a document to be told, to, to be sent to either law enforcement or to the attorney general announcing, do you recall? One, if you don't recall, just tell me you don't remember. At some point during that date or the next, I was more or less helping Scriven. I was a Scrivener writing up uh, documents, including allegations concerning what had happened that day. Yes. All right. Go ahead. Uh, there's a text from someone who is unidentified. It's the person whose phone, from whose phone this text was produced. It says lots of undue influence. I'm assuming that's Mr. Brickman. All right. So now read what, wait. so go ahead. I then respond, okay, sounds like we need to beef up the specific allegations. I then text again. So do we need to lay out the facts that led up to today's events, colon, KP taking NP, that would be Ken Paxton and Nate Paul, to Moore, that would be Margaret Moore, obtaining the referral, demanding that we investigate facially bogus charges, refusing to take our advice that there is no prosecutable offense, demanding that we hire outside counsel, overriding our advice a second time, and apparently now authorizing an improper fishing expedition by private attorneys into a civil matter. All right, and then then you have another one right after that, do you not? I do. Go ahead. I then continue. Or do we need to go further and describe the constant demands that we put the resources of the office at the service of NP's private interest? That's Nate Paul personally intervening in open records issues, demanding intervention in a charitable dispute over the objection of staff, demanding an informal opinion to apparently, parentheses after the fact, benefit Nate Paul, and now finally seeking criminal investigation of federal officials involved in a criminal investigation of Nate Paul. Keep on going. Could you please scroll? Yeah. I then send another text. All the while over the objection of staff, it's pattern and practice evidence strongly suggestive of an improper motive. All right, let me me stop you there a second. Do you believe the attorney, did you believe at this time that the attorney general that could enter into contracts, even if all members of his staff objected, did you have any question about that in your mind? He is the principal, and I believe he could. All right. What was your position as to whether either ultimately, however, there might come a time where the attorney general, in exercising what he believed he had the legal authority to do, could do something that became illegal by being used for an improper purpose? Did you have an opinion on that? I did. And what was it? Yes. The Attorney General could use the lawful powers and authorities of our office for a patently improper purpose, such as using the power of our office to benefit the interests of one individual citizen at the expense of the public interest. That is improper. If, in fact, you reach a conclusion that that has repeatedly been done, in spite of consistent advice against it by the staff, 
In your, what is your opinion where there ever comes a time that staff has to complain and say enough is enough? You can't yes. have improper yes. opinion. All right. S S I'm sorry. Overruled. He has the opportunity to offer his opinion. Okay. Yes, Judge. Yes, and that is precisely what we did. Did you consider it a mutiny? It was not a mutiny. How would you characterize it? We were protecting the interest of the state, and ultimately, I believe, protecting the interest of the Attorney General, and in my view, signing our professional death warrant at the same time. What was the stated awareness of all of you that knew the consequences of what you were doing when you staked out this position and decided to go to law enforcement? We understood the gravity of that act. We were fully cognizant of it. It was something that we did not want to do. It was something that we tried earnestly to avoid ever having happen. But when the moment came and we realized there was no other choice, that is the duty of a public employee to ultimately make that incredibly hard choice to serve the public interest, even at the expense of your principal, because he has insisted on an imp improper and we believed unlawful course of conduct. Mr. Banger. Did every single one of you pay an extreme price for what you did? Objection and proper opinion. It goes invades the province of the jury with regard to an article. Sustain. Rephrase. Bangert, what happened with you? How did you end your employment with the Attorney General's office? I resigned from my position immediately after the 2020 election. By the time I resigned, all of my duties had been taken from me. Uh, I was simply an employee in name only. When you, uh, after you went to law enforcement, how do you mean your duties were taken from you? Over the course of several weeks, um, I was excluded from and ultimately removed from any responsibility by the new first assistant. And then subsequent to that, in the middle of October, I was informed that I would no longer be overseeing the special litigation unit. I objected to that, and that was to no avail. Counselor, we're, you said about 10 minutes were it's, it's, for the benefit of the jury and the staff. Do we want to break here, or do you need a few minutes? That's fine. I want to have a few minutes, but that's fine. That's you fine. Want to if you have a few minutes, finish with the witness. If you're going to go longer, then tell me, and we'll break. Thank you so much. I always, I never want to be in the way of people taking a restroom break. All right. Thank you. Uh, we will break until uh, 11 o'clock sharp. That's a 20-minute break, members. Okay, we've been listening to the testimony from Ryan Bangert, who was the number two in the AG's office, the deputy first assistant, describing before we just before we went to break here what life was like for him in the AG's office right after he and uh, seven of the of his colleagues went to law enforcement and reported what they truly believed were illegal and unethical actions by the attorney general saying as sort of a play on uh, on words there on rhino that he was mm -hmm. you know the deputy first assistant in name only yeah and ashley it's interesting too while uh he is on center stage mm -hmm. ryan bangard is the other person who seems to be having a moment on stage is Anthony Osco. He is the young attorney um, who is uh, uh, objecting seemingly routinely, I don't want to say constantly, but definitely regularly. I, I think constantly. Constantly, is fair. okay, yeah, I, I was trying to be a little, is, little, is fair little conservative with and, the terminology. And we want to be, we want to be clear, you say young attorney because he graduated. Uh, I, I, 
I've looked at his bio, which I have on my screen. Um, he graduated from the University of Mississippi, that's Ole Miss, in 2016, and law school in 2018. So about five years of legal professional experience. He is an attorney in Dan Cogdell's Houston firm. Dan Cogdell is co-counsel to Tony Busby. Uh, Anthony Osco worked uh, for a number of years, he says several years, as a line prosecutor in the Harris County uh, District Attorney's Office, prosecuting an array of cases, both felony and misdemeanors, before joining uh, Dan Cogdell's firm. But he, you know, talks about on his bio here that, that he is a national champion in moot court and mock trial competitions. And it's interesting to see the way he is approaching this direct examination of this witness, Ryan Bangard. And, and Ashley, I'm not sure it's going over very well I with Dan Patrick. Going, yeah. I, I, this is definitely not a mock trial competition right now. You are in the Texas Senate and he has been routinely objecting, uh, uh, cutting off Rusty Harden. Rusty hasn't been able to get all of his questions out before he's been objecting. He's been interrupting the, the witness to object. And you can tell that there's a little bit of frustration yeah. from Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, who's presiding over this, you know, in fact, telling him, I've already ruled on that. I've already, the objection yes. has been overruled. Let him finish talking. So, you know, I think Rusty Harden is not appreciating it either. By, oh, by yeah, I the mean, looks yeah, yeah. That, that Harden, that we're able to see on the cameras. I can yes, only imagine yes. if we were there, you know, solely looking at Rusty Harden to see the looks he's giving him. Um, I just saw a tweet by my colleague Ryan Atullo who said, uh, I, it, I sure hope that Anthony Osco is getting paid by the hour and not successful objections. Yeah, well, <laughs> no comment. Yeah, right? exactly. I, I yeah. think I think we all got a little insight of how much they, they're getting paid. Busby saying five hundred dollars an hour. They're being paid uh, to to try this. Busby, of course, probably a different rate. Um, but Tony, let's talk about the objections because they were hearing it over and over and over again. Hearsay, hearsay, hearsay. I object. That's hearsay. Let's explain exactly what hearsay is. To the best of our ability, to uh, two non-lawyers non here. Two non-lawyers, but, but two people who have covered countless trials in, yeah. their, in our decades experience as journalists. Essentially what it means is that I have to testify to firsthand knowledge that I have. In other words, I can't get on the witness stand and say, I heard Ashley say, uh, whatever that would that would likely constitute as hearsay right I would have to be able to testify to only the things that I have said or things that were said to me because the, the other person is not there if you were to if I were to tell you what Tony said Tony is not on the stand to answer questions to, to for his statements to be objected to so you can only testify on things of your personal knowledge that involve you and so it's interesting that you know, there are conversations that Ryan Banger were ha was having with... That he was a party he to. he was a yeah. party to. If it was a conversation between three people, he was there, particularly when we're talking about this lunch with him and Nate Paul and Ken Paxton. And they're saying hearsay, 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 which is why you're saying, well, well no, he's there. He's in the conversation, which is why you're seeing um, Osco's, you know, objections being overruled. I think uh, just in terms of getting to the content of Bangert's testimony as well, um, and I talked to, uh, again, some legal experts last night, and I thought they made an interesting point, and we see Bangert kind of going to that as well. Certainly there are uh, factual comments that come out in testimony, but there are also more emotional statements, too, that, that can be used to help sway jurors. We've seen that in previous testimony where Jeff Mateer, uh talked about um, his feelings when, when Paxton was in his mind, uh, maybe possibly intoxicated on a phone call. But actually, one of the things that, that struck me just within the past few minutes about Bangor's testimony is the decision, the calculation, and the decision that these staffers made prior to going to the FBI with him saying that um, 
they were they had to weigh their duties as public employees it was an incredibly hard choice but he said they had to weigh the public interest at the expense of the principal uh, because uh, according to Bangert Paxton had insisted uh, on an illegal course of action in and their that, minds and, and again that really speaks Tony to it's not easy to be a whistleblower I think you know we talk about you know, the actions of the whistleblowers, particularly as they're coming to the stand. These are people at, at the time, you know, Ryan Banger said he was 43 years old. Mm -hmm. You've worked so hard and now you're at the point of, you know, really a pinnacle of your career. Right. You're, you're in the attorney general's office. And for someone who is a conservative, you are fighting the good conservative fight in Texas. That is the, the belief that they have. It's a that position of values yes. as much as it is a professional, exactly. uh, that they are almost the torchbearers of these conservative cause, these uh, religious liberty debates that, that Texas in many ways is ground zero for. And they knew, they knew that if we go to the FBI, it is not going to end well for us. There's no way we're, I mean, that is what you weigh. If I report, this is not just any boss. Your boss is the attorney general, a duly elected statewide official. If I report this person to the FBI of, you know, right. that this is going to have serious, serious repercussions. And it did. According to Bangert, he said that he resigned after soon after the 2020 election and that by the time he walked out of the door that his duties uh, had been essentially stripped of him throughout the, the subsequent weeks after they went to the FBI, um, that he was simply... Removed from cases, removed, that he yeah. was no longer... You he know, said, I was an employee in name only. Yeah. Yeah, it is very, very striking uh, to hear what he said. Let's talk uh, some about this morning's testimony, some of the things that he said, particularly when he was talking about a lunch that uh, at Attorney General Ken Paxton wanted him to attend with Nate Paul in regards to the intervention that the AG's office had filed in the lawsuit between the Mitty Foundation and Nate Paul. And what was particularly, I think, interesting about some of what he was saying with that was just he already felt that it was a conflict of interest. This was something that you did not do. If the Attorney General's office had intervened in a lawsuit, they were not then going to go have lunch with parties in that said lawsuit um that's just not something that they would have done and in fact he he objected he said very vocally you know to the attorney general to the point of telling him that the only way we can do this and it'd be ethical is if we get some sort of waiver from nate paul's lawyer and i thought it was very interesting while he did not come out and say it he said you know the attorney general paxton went into his office Minutes later, he returned with what was, he said, purported to be a waiver. A waiver. And Ashley, by the way, that is one of two lunches that we know of uh, involving Ken Paxton and Nate Paul. There was also a lunch that happened at Capitol Grill downtown that uh, Ken Paxton purportedly put together with staffers, high-ranking staffers of the Travis County District Attorney's Office, in which uh, Nate Paul attended mm -hmm. that lunch. Um, and try to possibly convince the Travis County District Attorney's Office and officials for the Travis County District Attorney's Office to uh, act on Nate Paul's behest. And so uh, at least two lunches uh, between the Attorney General and Nate Paul, um, the target, by the way, of an ongoing FBI investigation. And so this is where what I think this really... Uh, what this case and what the the house managers and the prosecution is having to or is going to have to try to prove to the jurors is this fine line between constituent services and Very someone being able to directly benefit from the attorney general's office to to think that there was a lunch with people with, of such high regard and with such power in the DA's office, with the Attorney General's office, would a general constituent be able to attend such a lunch? 
uh, you know, as invited by the Attorney General of Texas, or was this privilege that was given directly to Nate Paul in exchange for something else? And and that's a hard thing to prove with senators, right? Who themselves are politicians, who themselves engage listen in to yes, services. exactly, and listen to potentially certain people more than others. Uh, it was interesting uh, yesterday because Ryan Banger did speak to. Uh, this directly, something of an allyship between Kim Paxton and Nate Paul with uh, essentially Bangor testifying to this notion that Ken Paxton felt as though he had been wronged by law enforcement and of course Nate Paul bringing forward the claim that he had been wronged by law enforcement, Kim Paxton as we know from day one since he was indicted in 2015 on those state security fraud charges has vehemently denied any wrongdoing but also attacked those charges as prosecutorial overreach and so Nate Paul believed that he too was the victim of uh, law enforcement corruption, particularly corruption within the FBI, that they doctored a search warrant that allowed them to access and search his home and business properties here in Travis County. And, and to your point, this allyship, I think that is something that the prosecution, while they are trying to prove that, while that is a very strong part of their case, I think it's also something that they're going to have to watch and be careful with, because if a constituent truly believes and, and truly has convinced themselves and convinced the attorney general that they are being wrong, that something is not right here, then you, I think well, you're going to hear Busby argue, well, then the, 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 the it, attorney general it, had to it act. 1,000% speaks to Ken Paxton's defense, which is, if I believe that someone is the subject of an injustice or law enforcement corruption, I have a duty in my position mm -hmm. to do something to act on their behalf, and that's what I was doing. Yeah, and but then here comes what I think we're going to hear. You know, when Drew Wicker takes the stand, mm -hmm. when we hear others, is but was. Paxton getting something in return for that, and that I think is the big question. It's a very underpinning of this whole to... of this whole case. And if uh, Tony Busby, as promises, uh, dismantles that in some way, um, that's going to be a problem for well, for the there, House prosecution. A, bi a goes, big there, problem. There yeah. goes your constitutional bribery articles. Right. I mean, exactly. If that, if that if that in fact is the case. Yeah, and again, the, the two main things um, are that uh, they contend that Ken Paxton received a home remodel um, as a result of helping Nate Paul. That allegation seemed to have bubbled up from Drew Wicker, who was Paxton's quote-unquote body man, one right. of his top aides, who traveled with him, kept his calendar, things like that. But it was striking, and we saw Tony Busby really go at Jeff Mateer um, yesterday during his testimony about the degree to which uh, Jeff Mateer and the other whistleblowers sort of proved up mm -hmm. some of these mm -hmm. allegations or these rumors that they were hearing from within the Attorney General's office prior to going to law enforcement. Well, right, Drew Wicker apparently saying he heard a conversation. It's it's the thing that we've heard time and time again. It's the granite countertops. And that yes. he overheard a conversation of, you know, them saying that, and this is according to what the House managers reported and what was said during the hearing, the very public House hearing ahead of the impeachment that State Senator Angela Paxton wanted a different countertop, that um, the contractor said, well, I've got to call Nate, Nate I've got right. to ask Nate, um, and that that is what sort of, in Busby's words, a game of telephone right. then created created sort of, you know, some of these allegations against the attorney general and, and, and what he said to Mateer, well, why didn't you just go ask Paxson? If you thought right. that he had done something so wrong, if you thought that he had had his renovation paid for, well, why didn't you just go ask? I think that's a very interesting question. I was thinking about this last night and, and this morning too. If you are a whistleblower, um, to what extent do you have to 
prove your case or should you prove your case before you report it to whoever the authority is, be it you know a legal authority or human resources within your own company? Uh, you know, to what extent should you do your own investigation versus reporting a suspicion or a concern? Um, I don't know exactly how an attorney would advise a potential whistleblower in that case, but I think it is an interesting question. And, and again, uh, Busby, Busby struck to the heart of that yesterday, like, well, guys, uh, why didn't you just go ask Ken Paxton or do more cursory investigation prior to going to the FBI. They, of course, contend that they had uh, multiple pieces of evidence to justify them going to the FBI. Right, but to your point, Tony, at, w at what degree do they have to, you can't go to the HR department on the Attorney General of Texas. Right. You know, and, and again, these are not, you know, we think about that, but these also are seasoned attorneys. Exactly. And so they're not just going with anything, and you would think, to, to report on their boss, whom they like, whom they've said they consider to be a friend of the family, whom someone, you know, this is someone who they were really close to and they wanted to carry, carry on, you know, working for. Right. So, so that is... Again, those shared those shared values. Andrew, if you could just punch up the House, uh, excuse me, the Senate floor now. I want us to take a look at what is happening there, who some of the players are as well. Obviously, the senators have mostly vacated the floor at this point. This is prime time for them to take a bathroom break or grab something to uh, to eat. Um, I can see that Anthony Osco is still on the floor. He, again, is that attorney who works for uh, Dan, Dan Cog Cogdell, who is also the there. Exactly. Um, but I, I've not, uh, I'm not seeing too many other familiar faces at this point. Of course, Rusty Harden in his blue suit is talking to his co-counsel there in the distance, uh, Dick DeGaron. We can't see it from this shot, but there are several senators starting to come back onto the floor. There you can see uh, in, the, in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, Senator Sparks, Senator Birdwell, um, they're all talking Senator Blanco. We saw Senator Zaffarini walk back in. So the jurors starting to, to make their way back in. As they are to be here at 11 a.m., you see Senator West sitting there on time because they got in, they got a little yeah, exactly. chastised yesterday by Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick for not being. Who pointed out, even if I'm not here, yes, you, <laughs> you still have, have to, to be here exactly. at the time that I call. So we're about two minutes away from that 11 o'clock uh, requirement there. Um, Senator Joan Huffman just walking by uh, our camera there that uh, speaking to Senator West. Um, again, not, we know she's in the room. We know she's listening intently. Angela Paxton certainly there this morning, as are all members of the Senate as required by the Constitution, unless they have an excused absence. The Constitution and the rules that the senators, Correct. the majority of the senators agreed upon, um, saying that they would all be here, that they're all going to sit here and listen to to everything that happens, you know, in this room. The the other thing, Tony, as we're still waiting for them to come up, and one of the other points that Banger talked about in his testimony was what happened and how unusual it was for them to reverse an opinion of the Attorney General's office. And this is the opinion that was issued in an effort to try to stop a foreclosure sale right. of Nate Paul's property. And I thought it was really interesting that they actually, would, that, that opinion, by the way, never made public, never posted on the website for us right. all to see. Um, but the, he noted that at the bottom, at the end of the opinion, they wrote a note. Um, sort of saying, and I think if you were an attorney, if you were a lawyer looking at that, saying to indicate that that opinion had not gone through the very rigorous process that opinions normally go through, because this was something that happened in a matter of days, whereas these opinions normally take you know, weeks. And those attorneys also making the, the point that, that this opinion um, at 
at the behest of the Attorney General, they say, um, flew in the very face of how Texas had begun responding to the pandemic, that it was keep Texas open. And so oh, yes, it was Governor just- Governor Greg Abbott's directive. Yes, and so it just flew in the face of that. And that was the other reason it was so alarming to them. Um, you're now trying to stop a foreclosure sale and cite the pandemic. That, that was something that increased their alarm about the relationship between Kim Paxton and Nate Paul. Yeah, a foreclosure sale happening outdoors Correct. On the steps of a county courthouse, you know, when, yes, large gatherings were, were not being permitted at that time, but this certainly did not meet um, to their to their understanding and to the house manager's point. This was not meeting that requirement of this was not a football game. This was not a UT football game we're talking about here. This was, you know. And going back in time to what we know about that open records request is that it was sought by Senator Brian Hughes, who uh, Paxton allegedly reached out to directly and asked him to seek this opinion. So again, after that's- After it was written. After it was written. So again, that's also a uh, an example, according to prosecutors, of, of Paxton really engaging and involving himself in these uh, very, unique and alarming ways. Right. In fact, yesterday is when we heard Banger say he requested the information of who was the solicitor, who asked for this, and that Attorney General Ken Paxton gave him a number of a gentleman, not even a name, but a number, and when he called that number to find out more information oh, about Lord. the information being solicited for that opinion, the person had no idea yeah. what he was even talking about and that it was after that point that they then, um, it was State Senator Brian Hughes, who has said he did not know the full. He did story. not know the full backstory. He was being asked to do something by the attorney general, and you know he was doing it. It looks as though testimony is about to resume with Ryan Banger and Rusty Hardin. Ryan uh, Banger walking. You can see walking up to the witness stand right now. Mm -hmm. Getting getting seated there, and Rusty Hardin again taking his position as we expect to go for. A Probably about another hour, hour and 15 minutes of testimony, Governor, Sorry, you can continue. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick saying they'll generally take breaks around noon, 12-15. Uh, Let's Honor. listen in uh, as they Stella, can can get I back started. Uh, hard copy exhibits for, for the court and the other side on exhibit 571. And can you give the witness one so that it doesn't have to be put up on the screen? Is this already in evidence? It is, it is not. That's, that's what I'm going to seek to introduce. Thank you, Your Honor. So now, without going in uh, to specific contents, do you recognize this exhibit? Yes. And without talking about the contents as to what it says, how would, how would, you, uh, would you identify it in terms of what it is? This is a text message that was sent the microphone, by... Microphone, I'm sorry. This is a text message that was sent by the group of us to the Attorney General. All right, and does it also contain uh, the Attorney General's response? Yes. Uh, are, are you aware of people, uh, of, of any instance where there's been criticism that, that you did not seek to meet with the Attorney General? Are you I, aware that there's been that criticism? I'm aware of that, yes. All right. Now, uh, Your Honor, we, would, we, we moved to introduce 571 the understanding this witness participated in sending this along with the other uh, group of people we've been talking to as the whistleblowers. Any objection? No objection, Judge. Continue. Submit, right, can I have it up on the screen, evidence. please? The first page, uh, would you show who all is, would you for the record explain who all it says is sending this? The beginning at the top of the yes. page, yes. Lacey Mays, Deputy for Administration, is sending this email, which contains a screenshot, to Jeff Mateer, Blake Brickman, Ryan Vassar, Ryan Bangert, myself, Mark Penley, and Darren McCarty. All right, if you would look at this screenshot on that first page, if we turn, does this exhibit contain a screenshot of the text messages that, that you as a group, the addressees up at the top, sent to the Attorney General? 
Yes. And did you send it on what date, if you would look up there? The date is not listed, but this would have been... The screenshot is dated, is it not? The Can screenshot... Yeah, the first page. Yes, this is the, the email is dated October 1st. Right, right. The email has sent, been sent around, but if you look at the second page of this exhibit, does it contain uh, correspondence with where each of you, give it, let, me, let me back up, strike that, and I apologize, Mary, ma'am. Um, if, if you just give the jury the background of why y'all sent this and when you sent it. Yes. We sent this message to the Attorney General uh, after we had made a good faith report to the FBI. We wanted to speak with him. We wanted to bring him back to the office. So we wanted to invite him back to the office to speak with us so that we could address these concerns head on. Uh, we wanted, we were hoping that we could finally resolve these issues and in our view, uh, end this unlawful use of our office's resources. All right. Now, the screenshot was dated October 1st, and in fact, you, we, you, we, your, group, your group went to the FBI, I believe you testified, on September the 30th, correct? That's right. This email that Jeff, sent on, Jeff Mateer sent on behalf of all of you, would you read that out loud, published to the jury, please? Uh, the text message? Yes. Yes. Jeff Mateer at 1249 p.m. General Paxton, yesterday, each of the individuals on this text chain made a good faith report of violations of nice, law. Nice and slow. I'll begin again. General Paxton, yesterday, each of the individuals on this text chain made a good faith report of violations of law by you to an appropriate law enforcement authority concerning your relationship and activities with Nate Paul. We request that you meet with us today in the eighth floor conference room at three o'clock p.m. to discuss this matter. Now at that time, since when it says yesterday here, and I believe you testified that the two of you went to uh, the FBI on the 30th, correct? The and, group of us did. Yes, and then, and then uh, on the 1st, you send this text, so when we see on there, today, 12.49 p.m., this message from Mr. Mateer on behalf of all of you would have been sent on what day? The following day, the 1st. October the 1st. And at that time, did you know whether or not the Attorney General was back in Austin from his trip out of town? Yes, my recollection is that he had returned late the previous evening. Late the evening of the 30th? Yes, that's my recollection. Okay. Would you publish to the jury what he responded to you about three hours after you sent it? Yes, at 3.08 p.m., Jeff, I am out of the office and received this text on very short notice. I am happy, as always, to address any issues or concerns. Please email me with those issues so that they can be fully addressed. And so did you uh, email him with those issues? I don't believe we did. I don't recall. We wanted to meet with him personally. And if you did not, would you, why would you not have? He was well aware. And how did you take that, asking for the issues? I interpreted that message as he was not going to engage with us on this did he ever reach out to and try to? No, not to me. And, and as a former uh, deputy first assistant, you remain still with the office, available to talk to him for how long? I remained with the office until after the 2020 election in November, early November. At any time after, after you sent that text, did the attorney general ever attempt to discuss any of these issues with you? One time. When was that? I had turned in my notice and of resignation. 
I was in the process of gathering up the things in my office, and I was alone in my office, and he walked into the office unannounced and closed the door behind him, and was pacing to and fro in the office. He was very agitated, in my view. And he said to me, Ryan, I just want you to know that you're only sitting in this office today because of me. What else did he say? He said, this was not Jeff Mateer who put you here, it was me. He said what? He said, Jeff Mateer didn't put you in this office, it was not his decision, it was my decision. I put you here. Okay. And he was, it was a very odd conversation. I wasn't quite sure how to respond, so I just told the Attorney General that it was my hope that, that God would work things out in the end. That was the only time that he spoke to me alone about these issues, and that was it. What is your observation as to whether in encounters of unpleasant or difficult issues, the Attorney General's characteristic is as to whether, as to how he acts in issues of conflict or whether he avoids them. Objection of relevance. Sustained. After you left, could you describe for the jury the impact of all of this has been on you. Yes. That month was a very unsettling month. Uh, I was waiting uh, to be terminated. Uh, instead, I just had my job duties stripped from me and was left more or less a man without portfolio in the office. I watched as my fellow whistleblowers were placed under administrative leave and investigated. Um, I watched as certain members of the staff, the new staff, uh, treated them in a belligerent manner, including myself. And ultimately, uh, I, had to, I resigned. It was incredibly heartbreaking because I had believed in Ken Paxson and what he has, had been doing for years. I had moved my family here to Austin, specifically to go to work for him. And I watched all of these things that we had done as a leadership team slowly begun to begin to unravel. And it was absolutely heartbreaking to see that happen to an office that had been, in my view, a, a beacon for the conservative legal movement for years. Have you noticed he's not even here today? Objection to relevance. That's very relevant. I want the record Objection to reflect. To if I could, I'll ask that question Sustained. again. Sustained. Right. I want the record to reflect that Attorney General Paxton was not here Objection. entirely. I, I, I'm just making this for the record. I think we're entitled to point out. I'm objecting to the attorney that, testifying. Excuse me, let me finish, please. We're talking over each other. Court reporters cannot record. I sustain his objection. Yes, sir, I understand, and I'm not any longer trying to ask that question. I do want the record to reflect that neither yesterday nor today has the Attorney General graced us with his appearance. That's all I wanted to make that statement, please, for the record. I thank you very much, Your Honor. I'll pass the witness. Judge, we have a moment to just prepare my exhibits up on the bench or the yes. podium. And again, the point that Rusty Harden just made uh, about Ken Paxton now on the third day of his impeachment trial not being present. Uh, Rusty Harden saying that he really wanted to establish that. For the record, uh, we are seeing attorney Anthony Osco preparing for cross-examination of this witness, now proceed, uh, Mr. Bangert, who is proceed. now proceeding. Mr. Bangert, we heard a lot about your background. Obviously, you have a very esteemed career and resume. 
correct? Uh, my resume is what it is. Okay. Um, mine's not like yours, and so I'm just going to try and do a courtesy to you and ask you short and simple questions, okay? And I'd ask that if I ask you a yes or no question that you simply respond yes or no, all right? Understand. Okay. Now, you are currently represented by an attorney, correct? I am. Okay. That attorney is Johnny Sutton. Yes. That is the same attorney that represents Jeff Mateer, correct? It is my understanding that he also represents Jeff Mateer, okay. yes. So, so you and Jeff Mateer both have the same attorney? We do. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, Mr. Sutton is here today in the building, right? Yes. He's probably watching your testimony. I assume so. Okay. And as a matter of fact, the two of you were just in the restroom together about 15 minutes ago? Uh, you would know that because you were there too. Well, I know, right? But that's a yes, correct? That is a yes. Okay. So you guys have been in contact during your testimony in this trial? We have. All right. Now, you stated on direct examination that you did not provide any statements with regard to what you've testified in court today, right? Could you please reframe? I don't understand the question. Sure. And I think the record reflects when Mr. Harden asked if you made any statements in this case and when Judge clarified if you had made any statements before this testimony, you said that you hadn't. I do not recall testifying to that effect. Okay. So you've made statements previous to your testimony today, right? Again, when you say statements, have I spoken to anyone? I mean, you have made an out-of-court statement, Mr. Bangert. Are you talking about under oath? I'm asking you yes or no. Have you made statements about this case to anyone? You may answer the question. What's your objection? My objection, Your Honor, is if he would just please express what he means by statements. That has a legal significance and a practical one. This Overruled. Witness, this witness is not aware of the issue. Overruled. Answer yes. the question. So, it's a yes or no question. It's not a yes or no question. Well, then so. let me ask you a more specific question. Were you interviewed by the House Board of Managers in their preparation investigation of this case? Yes, I was. Okay. Were you inter interviewed by Mr. Harden and Mr. DeGarren prior to your testimony for this case? Prior to my testimony today? Yes. I was, yes. Okay. So those are two statements that you've made to people about your testimony in this case, right? I'm not trying to fight with you, counsel. I'm simply pointing out that the word statement carries legal significance, well, typically hearsay, under oath. Well, hearsay Those is are not under oath. Yes. Witness, yes, answer the question, not argue with the counsel. You've made two interviews prior to testifying today, right? I have given, I have given interviews, yes. Okay. Two of them. I have spoken both with the House Manager's counsel and I've spoken with Mr. Harden and Mr. DeGarren. Yes. yes or no, Mr. Banger, were either of those interviews recorded? No. Did you ask that those interviews not be recorded? No. Did your lawyer ask that those interviews not be recorded? Not to my recollection, no. So you don't know why they were recorded? Why they were not recorded? I do not. Okay. If Mr. Harden or Mr. DeGarren had had any objection to you being recorded during your interviews, would that have been a problem, yes or no? I, I don't understand the import of the question. Would okay. that have been a problem my, for my, me? My question is, if Mr. Harden or Mr. DeGarren had said, Mr. Bangert, you're giving an interview with regard to testimony in an impeachment trial. Can we record you? Would that have been a problem for you or Mr. Sutton? I can speak for myself. I would, I would have no problem with that. Okay. And despite your lack of objection to that, Mr. Harden and Mr. DeGarren chose not to interview you during your interviews with regard to this case? Chose not to record me. Yes. I assume that was their choice, but I was not recorded. Okay. And additionally, prior to that interview, when you met with the House Board of Managers, safe to say you wouldn't have had an objection to them recording you either, correct? I can't think of any of the time, no. Okay. And it just so happens that the House Board of Managers, the investigators in this case, chose not to record your statement either. As far as I know, they did not. Okay. So you would have to agree that there are a lot of things that you testified to when Mr. Harden was directing you that we were hearing for the first time on this side of the trial, correct? I honestly cannot answer that question. I do not know what you know and what you do not know. Okay. Well, you had information that you produced actually to both sides of this trial within the last two days, correct? There was a text chain that was produced by my counsel. Okay. We didn't see Mr. Harden produce those text messages during his direct, did we? Mr. Harden producing 
His text messages to whom? During his direct examination of you, he did not ask you about text messages that you produced yesterday during this trial. Yes or no? No, he did not. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes. Don't speak to him now. Just give it to him and then speak from the microphone. Thank you, Counselor. I'm handing you... Hold on. Everyone wants to hear you. I'm handing you what has been pre-marked as Attorney General's Exhibit 1000 and I believe 3, correct? It is marked AG 1003, yes. Okay. Now, you recognize this document, do you not? I do. These are text messages from your cell phone, right? Yes. You produced these to both sides in court yesterday. Mr. Sutton, my attorney, produced them yesterday. Okay. And you would agree that these are a fair and accurate... Counselor, excuse me, we do not have a copy of yes, what you judge. have. Continue. Yes, Judge. You would agree that these are a fair and accurate Honor, reflection. Pardon me. Your Honor, we were not given a copy of those. Could we have a copy of them, please? They gave it to us, so whatever. Thank you. I'd ask the record reflect that I have tendered to opposing counsel a copy of their witnesses text messages let the record reflect now mr banger you would agree that these are a fair and accurate reflection of the text messages between you and ken paxton in july and august of 2020 correct give me a moment With the only modification that the first text message is in June. Okay. Well, you produ your attorney produced these, so presumably he got them from you, right? Yes. Okay. Um, otherwise, fair and accurate reflection? Yes, they appear to be. Judge, at this time, I would move to admit AG Exhibit 1003. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Show the exhibit being entered into the record. Okay. Admitted to evidence, excuse me. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Banger, you talked about two very, very, very specific conversations that you had with Mr. Paxton um, that I think stood out during your testimony. The first one of those was a conversation at Polvo's, correct? We did, well, Nate Paul was part of that, but right. we were at Polvo's at lunch together with Mr. Paxton, okay. Drew Wicker, and Nate Paul. And the second conversation was essentially a conversation that you overheard Jeff Mateer was having, right? The conversation at the Raga meeting in Atlanta, yes. Okay. Two separate conversations. Yes. Um, did you provide, I don't recall, did you provide dates of those, specific dates of those conversations during your direct examination? I do not believe I did. Okay. Now, you talked a lot about your experience in your resume. I think you've clerked, you've worked at, was it Baker Botts as a partner, right? I have both clerked and worked at AcreBots as a partner, yes. You've worked at executive level positions in two attorney general's offices? Yes. You didn't get there because you don't have an attention to detail, right, Mr. Bangert? I'd like to think that I pay sufficient attention to detail. Right, and you document things that are important to you, do you not? Not always. Not always, okay. Um, well, let's talk about that. You had documented in this case something that you thought was very important, the foreclosure opinion, did you not? I made a document that outlined my concerns about, oh, sorry, you said the foreclosure letter? Yes, the foreclosure letter. Well, that we, I was shown the foreclosure letter today, yes. Okay. Um, at this time, I would ask Eric if you could publish the House Board of Managers Exhibit 119.
Mr. Mr. Banger, this is an email that you sent to Ryan Vassar on September 30th. Counselor, excuse me, has this been entered into evidence? Uh, my understanding is it has. If not, Judge, I'll ask to, I'll ask to enter. It's the House Board of Managers exhibit. At this time, I would offer. We do not object, Your Honor. Okay. Admitted into evidence. Thank you, Judge. Now, Mr. Banger, this is an email that you wrote to Ryan Vassar on September 30th of 2020. True? Yes. September 30th of 2020 is after you had the meeting with the other executives about going to the FBI with regard to Ken Paxton. True? This is at 9.29 a.m. that morning. Um, I do not, we had not visited the FBI at that point. Okay. It's the same day that you had a conversation with the other executive level AGs about going to the FBI, right? We did on that day. Okay. And September 29th, or excuse me, September 30th, that's two months after you ever drafted the foreclosure opinion that you talked about during your direct examination, correct? Slightly under, but about two months later, okay. yes. Do you typically write memorandums about things that happened two months ago? Yes or no? No. Does it stand out to you or does it seem odd to you to wait until the day that you go to the FBI or the day before you go to the FBI to write a memorandum about something that happened two months ago? No. Not odd at all? No. Okay. Now, to be clear, yesterday during Mr. Harden's testimony, he at one point said, I think by the end of July, beginning of August, you had been a part of three issues that related to Nepal, right? Well, depending upon how you count the open records issues is one or two. Okay. Well, you have the open records issue, correct? Yes. Your involvement in MIDI. I was involved in MIDI as well, yes. Okay. And then you've got your foreclosure opinion involvement. Yes, that is correct. I was involved in all. And as a matter of fact, a lot of those almost overlapped each other. True? At the edges and at the margins, they did overlap. Okay. Now, yesterday you testified to the jury that you were, had a boiling concern about this, correct? I did have boiling concern about this. Now, to be clear, House Boards 119, your email to Ryan Vassar, is the only memorandum and summary that you drafted with regard to any of your involvement with MIDI, open records request, or the foreclosure opinion. Yes or no? I can't recall. You can't recall. Okay. Well, we didn't see any other memorandums, have we? I haven't seen any in the trial today. Okay. Well, you would have produced it, so you'd know about it, wouldn't you? I produced everything I had. Okay. And all we got was this email. I produced far more than this email. Okay. Now, I want to backtrack a little bit, and we'll go back to that correspondence between you and Mr. Vassar. Um, you talked a little bit about the time from when you guys came out to the FBI and, and what happened to you after, okay? I want to talk about that. Um, Eric, would you mind pulling up Article 6 of the Articles of Impeachment? Article 6 accuses Mr. Paxton essentially of terminating or taking adverse personal action against employees for making a good faith report to law enforcement. Would you agree with that, Mr. Bangert? It says he violated his duties of his office by terminating and taking adverse personnel action against employees of his office in violation of the state's whistleblower law. Okay. So kind of what I just said, right? I, I defer to the document. Okay. Well... If we read from it, it talks about terminating or taking adverse personal action. So I would like to talk about what happened to you. Now, at no point after you reported to law enforcement were you terminated from your position. It's a yes or no question, Mr. Bangert. Were you fired or were you not fired? I was constructively discharged. Now, I asked you whether you were fired or not fired, yes or no. Answer the question. I was constructively discharged. Did Ken Paxton say you are no longer an employee of the Office of Attorney General? 
He did not say that. Okay, thank you. As a matter of fact, you left, you resigned from the Office of Attorney General as the Deputy First Assistant Attorney General. Did you not? I did resign. Okay. And you resigned under the title Deputy First Assistant Attorney General. That was my title at the time I resigned. Okay. So you were not demoted from your position as First Assistant Attorney General. I did not lose my title. Okay. And as a matter of fact, you were never suspended after you reported to the FBI, were you? I was not. Okay. You talked about Mr. I think maybe Webster, but certainly Ken Paxton stripping you of some of your responsibilities, right? Yes. One of those responsibilities was the fact that you were in charge of the Special Litigation Division, true? I was. Now that role was actually moved out from underneath you, correct? That is correct. And they put it in charge of the division chief that was running that division at the time, right? My understanding was that Patrick Sweeten was put in charge of that division, yes. So essentially Brent Webster promoted an underlevel assistant attorney general? Yes or no? I do not know if he promoted Patrick or not. He certainly added some responsibility for Patrick, correct? That was my impression, yes. And that bothered you? Yes or no? It came without explanation or warning, so yes, it was troubling to me. It's possible that Mr. Webster just was promoting somebody that had been, I don't know, giving an exceptional performance at their job. That was the excuse that he attempted to give me. That's not what I asked you. I asked you if it was possible. I don't think so. Okay. Certainly they wouldn't take a job from Ryan Banger, right? That's not exactly what I said. Okay. Sounded like it. Um, you said that the environment, did you describe it as being hostile after you reported to the FBI? Yes, it was. To toxic, right? It was. Um, affecting the ability for people to get their work done? It was. Okay. Now, you left and you went to work for the Alliance Defending Freedom, didn't you? I did. And in your time, well, that would have been 2020, true? Say again? When you left the Office of Attorney General and you went to Alliance Defending Freedom. Counselor, can you raise that mic up a little bit closer sure. to you? Okay. Is that better, Judge? That's much better for okay, I'm gonna all lean the in jurors. Yes. When, you, when you left the Office of Attorney General and went to Alliance Defending Freedom, that was in October, November of 2020. November of 2020. November of 2020. And since your time in November 2020, all the way up until, I believe, 2023, isn't it true that you have brought cases from the Alliance Defending Freedom to be co-handled with the Office of Attorney General? We have. Okay. And some of those cases you have worked directly with Brent Webster, have you not? There have been some, yes. Specifically, State of Texas versus Xavier Becerra. I believe that's the title of the case in Lubbock, Texas. Okay. And that was one of a few cases, true? Yes. And all the while that you were bringing cases from Alliance Defending Freedom back to the Office of Attorney General, Brent Webster was acting as first assistant, true? That is my understanding, okay. yes. And Ken Paxton was acting as Attorney General? Yes. I want to talk to you about the open records request, okay? You kind of gave us an explanation of how the process works, so I just want to rehash that out. My understanding is that if an individual makes a request to a state agency, that state agency has a certain time period to go to the Office of Attorney General and make a request for a ruling, right? There is a statutory time period to request a ruling, yes. Right. So in this case, the statutory time period, well, for example, when Nate Paul went to the Department of Public Services in March of 2020, if that was March 3rd, they had till March 13th essentially to request your office give an opinion, true? I do not recall the specific dates, nor do I recall whether it was Nate Paul or one of his attorneys who made that request. Okay, I just wanna clarify, you do not recall the specific dates in which the DPS 
request by Nate Paul's attorney was made? It was in the spring of 2020, but I don't recall the precise dates. I'd have to see some documents around okay. that. <clears throat> Eric, would you mind pulling up Article 3? And while we're doing that, just for a little background, Mr. Bangert, the requests by Nate Paul's attorneys for the records involved in the investigation, all, uh, it was for the, uh, initially the Texas State Securities Board, right? Yes, the initial request went to SSB. That was in 2019. Is that a question? Yeah, that was yes, in 2019. Yes. yes, it was. Then you've got DPS. That request was made in the spring of 2020. That is correct. And sometime later, arguably end of May, there was a request made for FBI's comment or brief on the DPS request that was originally filed in the spring, right? I believe that was part of the okay. second request. Okay, so we're talking about three different records requests, correct? I would classify it as two with a secondary request attached to the second. Okay. And then you also have to throw in the request for reconsideration, right, on the Texas State Securities Board? That was part of the first file. So essentially, the Office of Attorney General makes four separate decisions about records relating to Nepal. We made at least three. I don't know if it was four. Okay. Well, let's go back to fall of 2019. Texas State Securities Board. At that time, was Ken Paxton the office of it? Was the he was the AG of the Attorney General's office, right? Yes, he was. Now, when Nate Paul made that request through Aaron Borden, his attorney, in fall of 2019, that pr that initial request was denied by the Office of Attorney General, was it not? Yes, the ORD did. Well, when you say denied, it it sustained the request for exemptions and exceptions by the board. Sure, meaning that the Texas State Securities Board while Ken Paxton was AG, was not required to turn over records to Nepal. That's right, the November request did not require turnover of records. Let's move forward to 2020. You had a conversation with Justin Gordon about a request for reconsideration of the Texas State Security Board records, true? I did. And ultimately, you ended up having conversations with Ken Paxton about that request for reconsideration. I did. And ultimately, the Office of Attorney General again did not rule that the Texas State Board, the, the Texas State Securities Board, was going to have to turn their records over to Nepal, did they? We did not require them to turn their records over. Okay. So up until that puts us in February or March of 2020, would you agree? We're ballpark in that area, yes. Right. Ballparking it because yesterday you stated it was right around the time COVID started. Yes. That's a whole other convo we'll get into in a little bit. Okay, so Texas State Securities Board records are not given to Nate Paul. Let's move on to DPS. Um, now, to be clear, the ultimate ruling in, the ultimate decision by the Office of Attorney General with regard to the DPS records was that they refused to rule in that situation. It was a no decision. Okay, now I wanna to talk to you about what that means. If the Office of Attorney General refuses to rule on a records request, that means that the state agency that was requested does not have to turn their records over to the individual, right? We did not require disclosure based on that ruling. Okay. And so, as a result of that ruling, the Department of Public Safety did not turn their records over to Nate Paul or his attorneys, true? That ruling did not require disclosure. Okay. Well, you're aware that there was a writ of mandamus filed by Nate Paul's attorney for those records they were trying to get from you, correct? You're going to have to, the writ of mandamus, I believe, occurred with respect to the initial request. I don't recall one on the second request, but it may have happened. You would agree there was a writ of mandamus filed? At some point, it was my understanding that a writ had been filed. Okay, and you're not going to tell this jury when that suit was resolved, are you? No. For a matter of fact, it could have been pending into the winter of the next year, true? As far as I know, and it's, but to, for, a, for clarity, when you say writ of mandamus, I'm assuming you're talking about federal practice. No, I'm talking about no, writ of mandamus in the district court 
for the Department of Public Safety records. You're talking about the second issue then? Okay. Yeah. No, yeah, there was a there was a pending action in the district court. Okay. So they weren't just going to Office of Attorney General to try and get these records that they were after, right? Could you repeat one more time? They weren't just going to the Office of Attorney General, Napal and his lawyers. They were also going to the district court to try and get the records they were after, correct? That was my understanding. Okay. Now, DPS was not required to disclose records after this refusal to rule, right? Our refusal to rule did not require them to disclose. You stated that that was contrary to precedent at the Attorney General's office, true? I did. But you would have to admit that this specific request made by Nate Paul and his attorney, Joe Larson, had some unique circumstances, true? I don't recall any unique circumstances. Well, you worked with Justin Gordon pretty closely on this case, didn't you? I worked with him very closely on the first file for SSB and somewhat, but less closely on the second file. Okay. Um, could you kind of, I mean, so you really delegated it to Justin Gordon to handle, right? No. He was the man in charge of this decision, was he not? He was the head of open records, answering to Ryan Vassar, the deputy for legal counsel right. at the time. And he drafted opinions, and he drafted the opinion to refuse to rule that you edited, true? I did edit the opinion. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes, you may. Just don't talk on your way up or back. Yes, Judge. I guess the point I'm getting at, Mr. Bangard, is that not every, like you said yesterday, you said that pretty much all of these requests are kind of the same. They're easy to rule on when it comes to law enforcement material, true? They're not all easy, but yeah. we get a lot of them. Right. Um, you, referenced the, you referenced the opinion, the law enforcement exception, true? Yes, I believe that's correct. Okay. That doesn't when you say the opinion, which one are you referring to, though? I want to make sure I'm answering accurately. Well, the DPS opinion. I believe that's correct. I need to see it again. And the FBI comment. Again, I, I need to see the document. To be clear, there was an initial request for DPS records in March of, or spring of 2020, true? That is my understanding, yes. Okay. There was a later, you, you're aware that DPS did not notify the FBI about the records, true? I don't recall that. You'd have to refresh my memory on it. So it sounds like you don't know every little detail about the records request, do you? No, and that's perfectly normal for a senior executive okay. not to know every detail. So yesterday when you said that the decision was not consistent with precedent, you didn't know every little fact about what was going on within this request, did you? I knew enough to make that determination. Well, you didn't know everything, did you, Mr. Bangert? I am not omniscient, so no, I did not know everything, but okay. I knew enough to make that sort of determination. And it's fair that maybe Mr. Gordon had a different opinion about what went on with regard to those records requests. Mr. Opinion, Mr. Gordon was working on that. I do not recall what his opinion was. Okay. Are you aware that ultimately the Office of Attorney General did disclose the FBI comment? I do not recall that. Okay. Are you familiar with June Haddon? June Haddon, the name is familiar. I believe she worked in the Open Records Division. Okay. Um, would it surprise you to find out that she ruled that the FBI's brief on the DPS record should be disclosed to Nate Paul and his attorneys? I'm not aware of that, but I'd have to see the ruling. Okay. You hadn't heard her name with regard to this litigation or case today, have you? No, not until today. Okay. And you have no opinion as to whether Ken Paxton prodded June Haddon to turn those records over to Nate Paul, do you? I have, you'll have to ask the question again. It was coming fast. There's no evidence, you don't know of any evidence, or you have no opinion that Ken Paxton told June Haddon to turn the FBI comment over. I'm not aware of any conversation to that effect.
safe to say that in conclusion, every single request for records from Nate Paul's lawyers, none of those resulted in him getting the records with regard to DPS and Texas State Securities Boards, right? I'm not aware of any okay. disclosures that were made. Okay. By, at least by our office formally. So essentially every ruling that was made with regard to those records was the same, had the same effect as if you refused to require DPS or Texas State Securities Boards to turn those records over. The net result was they did not have to disclose the documents. Okay. You were involved with Biddy as well, right? Yes. Now, you talked about the fact that Ken Paxton directly ordered you to intervene into the lawsuit, true? Yes. Now, <clears throat> you would agree that if you thought something was illegal, you wouldn't want to delegate it to a lower level attorney, true? That I, I don't even know how, no, I, I, that does not. Yes or no? Would you delegate illegal activity to a lower ranking attorney? The question doesn't make sense because I wouldn't carry out illegal activity. Judge, I'd ask a non-responsive. I've asked him a question. Answer the question. Yes or no? I would not instruct anyone to carry out illegal activity. Right. That's why you didn't have Ryan Vassar sign that opinion in July of 2020. I did not have him sign that opinion because I had a very bad feeling of where that was headed. Okay. Well, let's talk about what you did in the Mitty case. You had no problem instructing, well, let me rephrase that. You did instruct Justin, excuse me, Josh Godby to intervene into the Mitty case, did you not? I did. And when Ken Paxton asked you to file a motion to say stay, you told the jury that you were opposed to filing that motion to stay, did you not? I did. But you turned around and you asked Joshua Godby to file a motion to stay in that case, did you not? I don't recall that. Okay. He filed a motion to stay, didn't he? That is my understanding. Eventually, a motion to stay was filed. Okay. You didn't walk up to Ken Paxton and say, Ken, I don't agree with what you're doing, and so I'm not going to do it. I did not have that conversation with him, no. And at no point did Ken Paxton say to you that if you do not intervene into the MIDI case, that you're going to be fired. No, we never had that conversation. You are aware that MIDI has been previously of interest to the Office of Attorney General, true? You'll have to refresh my recollection. Okay, well when Greg Abbott was the Attorney General, you're aware that the Office of Attorney General filed suit against Mitty? Yes, that did happen. Okay, so you are aware that their background isn't necessarily squeaky clean? I wouldn't put it that way. Okay. You wouldn't, you would not tell You've got no knowledge that Ken Paxton was entering into the MIDI litigation for the purposes of benefiting Nepal, Nepal, would you? Well, I disagree with that. Okay. Do you have personal knowledge? Yes or no? I do. You do? Yes. Well, Jeff Mateer made you aware of the fact that the MIDI, excuse me, Jeff Mateer made you aware that World Class was disgruntled and not happy with Joshua Godby's performance in the intervention in MIDI. True? That was some time later, but I received an email, I was copied on an email, in which Jeff responded to current counsel for World Class mm -hmm. complaining about Joshua Godby. Okay. So World Class was complaining about Joshua Godby, true? They were. Okay. Now, at some point, you stopped talking to Joshua Godby. I want to say that that was, excuse me, let, let me back up. You stopped talking to Justin Gordon about the open records request, true? At some point, the issue came to arrest, right, so I would have no occasion to talk to him after. Probably when you made the final ruling not to disclose the records in the Department of Public Safety request. When the no decision was issued, yes, that's when it would have terminated. Now, about one or two days after that, it might have been June 2nd, you started talking to Joshua Godby about the Mini Foundation case, true? That sounds about right, yes. And Ryan Vassar has his hands in the open records request at that time, too, true? He was overseeing the open records division. Because he took your position, right? He did when I was promoted. Okay, so Ryan Vassar is also probably aware of 
these different interactions with Nate Paul between the Office of Attorney General and Nate Paul, correct? You'll have to ask him that question. Okay. Well, safe to say that he worked on the open records request with you, right? He worked on it, yes. And he worked on the foreclosure opinion with you, true? He did. Okay, so those are two different scenarios where you and him both worked on Nate Paul issues, true? At least those two. Okay, and it's fair to say that you and Mr. Vassar were discussing the fact that you both had been involved with Nate Paul. At what time? At some point when you were working on these cases. We had discussion around those two instances we discussed uh, the work that we were doing. Okay. So you would not tell our jury, the senators, that the executive level attorney generals did not know that different divisions or facets of the office were involved with or working on cases regarding Nate Paul, would you? We began to piece together the linkages between these matters over time. Okay. Um, but you didn't do anything about it until September, I wanna say 30th of 2020, true? That's false. Well, you didn't go to the FBI until September 30th of 2020? We didn't go to the FBI. Okay. Let's talk about that foreclosure guidance. Um, Eric, would you mind pulling up Article 2? And to be clear, Ken Paxton is allowed to intervene into a lawsuit if he thinks it's appropriate, true? Our office has authority to intervene. Okay, and he's in charge of the office, is he not? He is the elected attorney general. Okay, so if he wants to intervene in a lawsuit, he is allowed to do so. He has authority to do so. Okay. Looking at Article 2, it alleges that Mr. Paxton misused his power to issue written legal opinions under Subchapter C, Chapter 402 of the Texas Government Code. You're aware of this, right? Yes, I see the article on my screen, yes. Okay. Now, we actually looked at a copy of that exhibit. Eric, would you mind posting, entering exhibit 192, AG 192? And Judge, for the record, I believe it is an exact copy of a House Board Manager exhibit that they've already published. Would you scroll to the second page, Eric? And just to be clear, Mr. Banger, when we talk about that very last paragraph, you actually signed this opinion, right? Yes. Okay. And by signing it, you would agree that you have adopted the statements within it, true? Not necessarily. Okay. So you just signed things at will? No. No? Okay. And you signed this document, right? I did sign this document. And the very last sentence or paragraph in that document says, it is not a formal opinion under subchapter C, of chapter 402 of the Texas Government Code, true? Would you scroll down to the last paragraph? Well, you, you wrote the opinion and you read it a minute ago. You would I'd agree like with to that. See the I'd like sure. to see the document. I think I've got a copy. Ah, there it is. Got it. You wrote, we trust this letter pro provides you with the advice you were seeking. Please note this letter is not a formal attorney general opinion under section 402.042 of the Texas Government Code. Rather, it is intended only to convey informal legal guidance. Yes. You, you wrote that, right? I did. That was on this letter when you issued it in 2020, right? It was. Okay. So the very face of the document that you signed specifically states that it is not an opinion under 402, true? No, that's not correct. Specifically, it's not a formal attorney general opinion under section 402.042 of the Texas Government Code. It is not a formal attorney general opinion okay. under section 402. It's very different. Okay. Let's talk about formal opinions. There's a specific place on the attorney general website for a formal opinion, is there not? Opinions that are issued are listed on our website, yes. They were signed KP numbers and they are accessible by the public. They are signed KP numbers. At this time, Judge, I would move to offer AG Exhibit 6 after I provide a copy to opposing counsel.
What we're watching here what, is defense attorney Anthony Osso questioning Ryan Banger, who is the former no second in charge at the AG's office. Let's it's continue like to, to listen yes, to yes. this testimony. Just so we can follow along. All right. Thank you, sir. Admit this exhibit into evidence. No objection. And Eric, Eric, if you would publish and just stay on the first page. So up here in the top left corner, we've got opinion number KP0322. True? Yes, it says opinion number KP0322. Okay. And that is an opinion number that is associated with a formal opinion. I have not seen the rest of this document, but I'm assuming that this has the form and shape of an informal opinion. Okay. Did you state yesterday during direct examination that Ken Paxton doesn't have a hand in signing or dealing with formal opinions? I don't believe I said that, no. Okay. So you would agree that he does pay attention to what he signs and what he issues on his office letterhead, correct? He is required, or, well, I should say, he has a practice of signing formal opinions himself. Okay. And that opinion has his name on it, true? I cannot see it, but I, I, I would be welcome to look at the signature block. Eric, would you flip back to the signature line? Okay. You see Ken Paxton's signature on that opinion, right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> he has to sign these formal opinions, does he not? I believe that is the practice of the office. Unless he's been recused, in which event Jeff Mateer would sign the formal opinions, true? That was the practice of the office. Okay. Now, I want to talk to you about the opinions in this case. Originally, Ryan Vassar drafted the formal, or not formal, excuse me, the informal guidance letter with regard to foreclosure sales, correct? The docu yes, the, the informal opinion that was issued on October, August 1st, he did draft the initial draft, yes. Now, the way that that record ruled, or excuse me, that that letter ruled was essentially that you didn't attack the 10-person restriction from the executive order, right? You just said that judicial foreclosure sales were accepted from the rule and could go on with that restriction. I would need to see the document to refresh my recollection on the precise contours of the opinion. Eric, would you pull up Exhibit 192? I mean, Mr. Banger, you drafted this opinion, did you not? Well, Mr. Vassar drafted it, and I provided edits and okay. corrections to it. So you're familiar with the content? I was in three, I was three years ago. Okay. Well, if you take a look at it, you would agree that it ruled that foreclosure sales could still go on despite the fact that there was an executive order restricting public gatherings outside to 10 people. True? Please go to the next page. There were very limited circumstances under which foreclosure sales could proceed, but we were subjecting those to the hard 10-person cap. I mean, you testified with the, regard to the subject matter of this yesterday, didn't you? I did. So you would agree that you said that despite the fact that 10 people at max can gather in public, foreclosure sales can still occur, true? That misrepresents the opinion. Well, if there are, you said that foreclosure sales could still go on, did you not? Is that not what that opinion says? No. It doesn't seek to invalidate the 10-person rule, does it? You need to go to the next page of the sure. opinion. Go to the next page, Eric. Thank you.
the second full paragraph on page three sure. as operative language. Elaborate on that. Pardon me? Tell us about that. If a foreclosure sale is subject to and not exempted from the 10-person attendance limit imposed in Executive Order GA-28, it should not proceed if one or more willing bidders are unable to participate because of the attendance limit. Okay. So how are you saying that when Ken Paxton asks you to change the opinion that is co it is contrary to precedent and the position of the Office of Attorney General at that time? It made the ability to proceed with those types of sales more restrictive under the COVID limitations than our previous draft would have. It made it more restrictive? Yes. Right, which means that in a sense, it benefited people that maybe didn't have their jobs at the time and didn't have money to pay their mortgages off, true? I do not know who this was benefiting, at least at the time I was writing it, I didn't know who it was well, benefiting. did you lose your job during COVID, Mr. Bangert? Say again? Did you lose your job during COVID? I did not. Did you struggle with the ability to pay a mortgage during COVID? I did not. You would have to agree with me that many people did lose their jobs during COVID, true? I understand that that did happen. Okay, and as a result of losing their jobs, many people probably couldn't afford rent and they couldn't afford their mortgage, right? I also understand that finance, financial institutions were suffering because of restrictions on their ability to That's foreclose on their I, loans. Objection, non-responsive. May he please answer the question, Your Honor? May we be, let he be allowed to answer? Is that an objection, or are you just it making is, a comment? It is, it is objection. It overruled, but let him clearly answer the question, but answer the question directed. Yes or no, my question was yes or no, could that affect people and their ability to pay their mortgages and their rent? Could what affect them? A ruling that foreclosure sales, or excuse me, that COVID was in existence. COVID was in existence at okay. that time. And it caused people not to have money and not to be able to afford rent and not to be able to pay their mortgages, true? I believe the economic disruption caused by COVID had some of those effects. Okay, and the job of the Office of Attorney General is in part to protect the public, true? The Attorney General's office is a sacred trust and it's always to be used for the public benefit. Okay. Right, now- All of the public. Eric, could you publish Exhibit 119 again? This is your memorandum of what happened with regard to the foreclosure opinion. And you stated in Exhibit 119 that you were not certain why Ken Paxton wanted this foreclosure opinion issued, true? There's no exhibit on my screen. 119, 119 Eric. May we see it, please? I think it's been entered, Rusty. I said, we don't have it. Oh, I understand. Eric's pulling it up. We don't have a copy. It's, it's y'all's exhibit. Is it in evidence? I don't think it's in evidence. You're it's in evidence, up. Judge. I've already referenced it during yeah. this examination. He submitted it earlier. You didn't object, I believe. Ah. Oh, I believe that's the case. If that's yes, the case. No, this... I if that's the case for an error, but I, th I don't think we had it marked as an evidence. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. You stated that you were uncertain why Ken wanted the foreclosure opinion issued. True? He had provided me a rationale. Is it yes for... or no? You said in this memorandum right here, you were uncertain. I was uncertain. Okay. Now, you did not include the fact that Ken Paxton was texting you all the while you were editing and drafting that report, did you? I don't believe I mentioned text messages in this document, no. And yesterday you told all the senators that it was contentious between you two on the phone at some points, did you not? Oh, I don't recall saying that. Okay, so it was calm and collected the entire time? It was not calm and collected the entire time. Okay. Well, you stated to them that you were objecting vehemently over the phone with Ken Paxton, true? I did not say that. You were objecting to Ken Paxton, were you not? I was having conversations with him in which he was frantically telling me to make edits, corrections, it's and ultimately yes or no changes. Question. It's a no, yes or no question, Mr. Bangert. You disagreed with Ken Paxton over the phone, true? I had conversations with him about the contours of the opinion. Okay, so you're not saying you disagree with him then, are you? I was trying to understand what he wanted as his subordinate. Okay. You didn't mention text messages yesterday, did you? I did not. All right. 
Eric, if you would flip to AG1003 for me. Now, Mr. Banger, you stated on direct examination yesterday that, quote unquote, Ken Paxson was acting like a man with a gun to his head. Did you not? I did say that. Okay. Now, looking at the last set of text messages here, um, if you'd flip to the last page, Eric. I'm just going to read from the exhibit. Thank you again. I can't express in words how much I appreciate your work, especially over the weekend. I am grateful because I feel like hundreds of people will be protected from harm and maybe devastation. You, had, you and Ryan deserve all the credit. Thank you. I hope that your Sunday is relaxing and enjoyable with your family. He texted that to you that day, didn't he? 1219 on Sunday. Yes. Okay. Now, did you mention that to the House Board of Managers when you were interviewed about this case? I don't recall if I mentioned this text message. Did you mention these text messages in your interviews with Mr. Harden or Mr. DeGarren when you were preparing for testimony and trial? I don't see why I would have. Okay. And did you include it in your memorandum to Ryan Vassar that was produced? There's no reason why I would have. Showing gratitude and why he wanted to have this foreclosure opinion worded the way he did. He did. I don't believe, I don't believe that he was telling the truth. Well, truth. well sure. certainly not a text message from you in these texts objecting or saying that you disagree with Mr. Paxson, is there? Agree with him here. You don't disagree with him here. I do not state it in writing here. Okay. And you signed the opinion that was ultimately issued in this case, true? I did sign it. And that opinion has no binding effect. It is a persuasive opinion. Persuasive at best. Persuasive opinion. Okay. Did you tell the FBI about these documents? I believe they were provided to the FBI. Okay. We just didn't get a copy of them until today? I did not have them in my possession. Oh, okay. They were in the possession of my counsel who found them Did you delete recently. your texts? No. So you would have had them on your phone, true? No. I did not intentionally delete my texts. Okay. My your texts text, are no longer... Your texts no longer were deleted, to yes or no? Gentlemen, don't talk over each other. Your texts were deleted, yes or no? Your texts were deleted, yes or no? I no longer have access it's to texts... It's a yes text. or no question. I no longer have access to texts past one year. Okay. So in the year, you didn't think to take screenshots of these? Excuse me? You didn't think to screenshot these messages? These were screenshotted back in 2020. Okay. You just, you just didn't keep a copy? I did not. And you're not going to sit here and tell us that you know that the foreclosure opinion ultimately affected or benefited Nate Paul, are you? Oh, I believe it did affect and benefit you, him. You have no personal knowledge of that, do you? I have, I have since learned that it did benefit him. You wrote in that memorandum that you learned through the Austin Statesman, did you not? May I see the memorandum again? Eric, would you please pull up the memorandum? That's a newspaper, correct? The Austin American Statesman? Yep. Yes. Okay. So you got your information from a newspaper, did you not? If we're believing your memorandum. If I could see my memorandum, I can tell you. Oh. Eric, would you? 119, Eric. Thank you. I think it says, on the following week, on August 4th, the Austin Business Journal, excuse me, I stand corrected. The Austin Business Journal reported that World Class had placed several properties into bankruptcy. So it did. Are you aware of when the foreclosure was supposed to take place? I was not aware of any foreclosures of Nate Paul properties when I was writing the opinion. No, I'm talking about after. I'm talking about August 3rd and August 4th. Were you I aware? I subsequently learned that that was taking place. Okay. That the foreclosure was supposed to take place on August 4th. That, I don't know for sure, but it would have been the statutorily appointed date, whatever that was, in 2020.
And yes, now that I'm looking at my document, I do say August 4th, so that would have been the date. Okay. Uh, may I approach the witness, Judge? Just to hand yes, the document. May. Judge, at this time, I would offer AG Exhibit 295. Any objection? May I have just a second? I'm sure. sorry, Judge. Thank you. No objection. Uh, we'll enter. What was the number on that? I don't have the number on that. 295, both. Judge. Uh, enter 295 into evidence. Eric, would you mind publishing AG 295? That is a letter from Sheena Paul to the judge regarding the bankruptcy proceeding, excuse me, the foreclosure proceeding occurring the next day, dated April, excuse me, August 3rd of 2020, correct? This is executed by Brian Elliott. Attorney for world class, right? I assume so because it has world classes, one of their property names at the top of the letterhead. You would agree that this document has the letterhead of August 3rd, right? It is dated August 3rd. Now you were not present in the district court when this document was filed, were you? No. So you have no idea what impact it had on the district court judge in that proceeding, do you? I have not talked or spoken with uh, Judge Gamble about this, no. Now, the very next day, the day that the foreclosures are supposed to occur, you find out that a bunch of Nate Paul properties are put, excuse me, world-class properties are put into bankruptcy, right? That's what the Business Journal reported. Okay. You've been in civil practice for quite a long time, true? Over a decade okay. at that point. You are very, very aware of what happens to properties when you file bankruptcy, are you not? I was not a bankruptcy practitioner. Well, you're, surely you're aware that when you put a document, or excuse me, you file bankruptcy on something, it causes a motion to stay, does it not? There is an automatic stay that's applied based on my recollection. There you go, which would prevent any type of foreclosure sale, would it not? Again, I am not a certified bankruptcy practitioner. I know that there are exceptions to that. I can't even begin to speak to the legalities of these properties or how those would have applied in these cases. Well, you knew a lot of law, I mean, on direct examination with Mr. Harden, and now you don't know about bankruptcy proceedings? Mr. Harden did not ask me about bankruptcy you, proceedings. You had no problem putting in your memorandum that the, that the properties went into bankruptcy? The properties were going into bankruptcy, that's correct. Okay. Oh, I'm possible. sorry, they were going to foreclosure. It's foreclosure. Po it's possible that the bankruptcies, it's possible that the bankruptcy filings did not, or those are what prevented the foreclosures, true? I don't know. Okay, well. But I do, I, I think it's interesting that World Class submitted a copy of our- Objection to non-responsive. Opinion. Objection to non-responsive. May I approach the witness, Judge? Yes, you may.
We're continuing to watch the impeachment trial of Attorney General Ken Paxton. And what's happening now is you're seeing a defense attorney, Anthony Osso, trying to submit into some to evidence here some documents related to the memo that he sent out that Ryan Bangert, who was the second in charge at the DA's office, excuse me, AG, the yeah. AG's, not DA's <laughs> office, sent out regarding the foreclosure sale and, and prevention of foreclosure of the Nepal properties. I would like to offer AG exhibits that I've handed to both uh, opposing counsel as well as your honor. I believe it's 262, 265, 275, and 283. Hold on, slow down. 283, 275, 265, 262? Yes. Okay. I can shorten this a little bit. If he represents that these are their exhibit numbers that were originally agreed to, that we said we would not object to any of your exhibits. Okay. If they're covered by that objection, I mean, if they're covered by that agreement, then we have no objection. Are they covered? They are covered, Judge. Well, take that back. No, they're not. That's why, I'm, that's why I intend to offer right now. We have not previously agreed to these. I understand. Just give me a couple more minutes. Then. I don't care. No objection, Your Honor. Oh. <laughs> Can you just uh, clarify for the record? We have one with a number and what the other numbers are. You may have the copies back. So for purposes of the record, we're offering 262, 283, 275, I only gave you, th and then uh, also 269. No objection. 269 was a new number from the one you repeated back to me. Yep. Just want to be clear. 269, 275, 283. And 262. I think I said 265. You repeated what I said. I was incorrect. It's 269. Okay. There's been no objection. I believe they said no objection. Mr. Harden, you said oh, no objection, action. correct? Yeah. Sorry, Judge. Please enter okay. those documents into the record. Just going to pat. Uh, okay. Thank you. Into evidence. Excuse me. May I approach the witness, Judge? Yes, you may. These are all bankruptcy filings by Nate Paul and his attorneys made on August 4th and August 5th, okay? Say so. All right. Now, if these bankruptcy filings were filed on August 4th, the date that the foreclosures were supposed to occur, that would stay the foreclosure sale, would it not? I don't, I, I would ha I don't know. You don't know. Perhaps. So it's possible that Ken's issuance of the informal guidance letter didn't cause the foreclosure sales to go away. It's possible. I do not know what effect that letter had okay. on the foreclosure sales. Are you a Trump fan? I'm sorry? Are you a, a fan of Donald Trump? I voted for President Trump. Okay. You're a staunch conservative, are you not? I am. Are you aware that only a week after you guys issued this opinion, he issued an executive order that basically mimicked the attitude towards foreclosure sales? I'm, I'm not familiar with that executive order. Okay. And so that brings us into the fall of 2020, right? August, September? September is the beginning of fall. Okay. Um, and you didn't really have any contact with issues regarding Nate Paul from August of 2020 up until September 28th, right? Oh, I disagree with that. Well, you weren't working on the foreclosure the witness, opinion. Please speak up when you're... Yes, I disagree with that. You were not working on the foreclosure opinion. That was completed on August 1st. Okay. You weren't working on MIDI. Uh, Mr. McCarty had assumed responsibility for that. You were not working on MIDI. I was not working on MIDI at that time in August. And you were not working on the open records request, true? 
Those were finished. Okay. So you were not personally working on any matters that involved Nate Paul at that time? I was actively speaking with other members of the executive team about what was happening at that time, which was the desire to hire outside counsel. So everybody, I assume, is on the eighth floor at this time, right? We had, COVID orders were still in place. I don't recall who was there every day. I was there every day the office was open. And let's talk about that, because the OAG's position at that time was that everything should open up, was it not? We wanted everything to be as open as possible, consistent with public safety and the governor's orders. Even after you left the Office of Attorney General, your employees at the Office of Attorney General weren't even present. There were some who were not present. There were some? There were most of them that were not present. My recollection was there were periods of time where a large majority of them, large majorities of them were not working from the office. Periods of time that post-dated your employment at the Office of Attorney General. I cannot speak to that. Because you weren't there. Because I was not there. So that's not really inconsistent with the situation that was going on at the Office of Attorney General, was it? Yes or no? That the, that the attorneys were yes not or, present? Yes or no? Oh, that had nothing to do with our policy. Okay. Nothing. So you were not personally a part of the hiring of Kamek, were you? No. You found this out on September 29th of 2020. That he had been retained by the attorney general directly? No, that he was filing subpoenas with Michael Wynn. Yes, I learned about that on the 29th. And you're saying that that is the very point that it kind of stood out to you all, what was going on, right? That was the tipping Chris, point. That crystallized a number of things. Okay. Now, when you say it crystallized a number of things, you did not have all the facts with regard to that investigation, did you? I personally did not. Okay. You didn't investigate that case, did you? Was I... What do you mean by I wasn't investigating that case? You, you didn't investigate the referral that was given by the Travis County District Attorney's Office, did you? I was not the primary responsibility for that. Everything that you took with regard to that investigation came from Mr. Penley or Mr. Maxwell? No. Those were the people responsible for investigating it, were they not? They were responsible. Okay. You were not responsible. That was not part of my responsibility at that time. Okay, so you weren't responsible. Now. Despite that fact, you went to the FBI on September 30th, correct? I did go to the FBI on, on September 30th, yes. You went to the FBI without talking to Ken Paxton first, true? Oh, I talked to him many times prior to that. You didn't talk to him about the fact that you were going to go to the FBI, did you? We did not talk to him. We did not tell him we were going to the FBI immediately prior to going. Right. So when you and Mr. Harden were talking about the conversations you had with Ken Paxton about the fact that you wanted to talk to him, that was all after you had already gone and reported your boss to law enforcement, true? The text messages that we reviewed today were sent after we made our good faith report. Okay. So you did not take the time to hear his side of things out before you went to law enforcement? I disagree. And at that point, you took it upon yourself to send a letter to Brandon Kamick as well, did you not? I, if I can recall correctly, I was the one who did send the email containing Jeff's letter. Okay. I'm, again, I'm stretching my memory, but I think I was the one who sent it. Now, prior to doing that, you talked earlier about a set of text messages. Uh, I would ask to admit uh, to publish House Board Managers 225. Eric, would you? It's been admitted, Judge. And Council, we're going to be going to the lunch break. I've gone a little longer, a few more, more minutes. Do you want to break now, or do you want to continue for I'm a few fine more minutes? I'm right now, Judge. Is good for you now? Yep. Okay, we'll break for lunch now. Your, Your Honor, I apologize. Can, we, can I raise one issue? Uh, I apologize, Your Honor. Can I raise one issue before we break for lunch? Yes. Um, that may just help speed things along with this witness. Uh, you admonished Mr. Harden at the beginning of the day that if there were any statements that Mr. Bangard had provided that we haven't seen, that he was to turn them over to us. The witness has testified that there were actually two interviews that he gave to the House. We still don't have any information related to those. To the extent that there's work product mixed with that, I think they can redact that and provide us the, the statements. But I just request that we get those over the lunch break, and that may uh, allow us to not have to recall the witness later. Just continue to look during lunch break for those documents if you have those. 
Thank and, you very much. And if you do, turn those over by the end of lunch. Sir, we, we do not have it, but I'll continue to be sure. Okay. Thank you. We will uh, return at one uh, one ten. I don't need it. We have been watching the impeachment trial of Attorney General Ken Paxton. We've been hearing defense attorney Anthony Oso question Ryan Bangert, who was the deputy first assistant in the AG's office. Bangert resigned shortly after the 2020 election, he says in November. This was after he had reported Paxton, he and seven other whistleblowers to the feds for fear that Paxton was taking action that was illegal and unethical. And what we've been hearing from from Oso really trying to to put a hole in the house in the house managers and their argument that Paxton engaged in uh, having his office write and then rewrite an opinion regarding to foreclosure sales that could happen during the pandemic. And so initially, uh, Banger says the staff wrote an article saying that those sales could happen in accordance with Governor Greg Abbott's order that Texas was, quote, open for business during this time, but that Attorney General Ken Paxton told his staff to rewrite that opinion in order to, they say, help Nate Paul and stop the foreclosure sale of properties for Paul. And so uh, this is the prosecution's second witness that we've been hearing from. And it appears that the defense is wrapping up their arguments with him, their, their, their cross-examination of him right now. And so we could potentially see a, a follow-up, but perhaps a third witness called to the stand after lunch. That's certainly what we would anticipate would happen. Now, if you were listening before they went to break and you were wondering what exactly are those documents that they're asking about. So on the stand, Bangert acknowledged that he was interviewed by the House board managers and that he did an interview with Rusty Harden and Dixie Guerin ahead of this trial. But those interviews were not recorded. And the defense is seemingly taking issue with that. Uh, and wanting to see some sort of documentation or record. Rusty Hardin and the rest of the prosecution have said they don't really have record of that. It's not uncommon for attorneys to talk with their witnesses before they call them to the stand, but that they are trying to find some sort of information related to that. But the defense saying that if they can't find those documents over this lunch break in this lunch hour that they will rec recall the witness. You can see at the left hand side, the bottom of your screen there, State Senator Angela Paxton, who has been at this trial again every day, her husband um, on trial and, and she's been very stoic in her approach and her opinion to the day, though she's not allowed to participate in the deliberations and will not be allowed to vote with the other members of the Senate. But remaining very, uh, again, stoic throughout all of this, and I say, you know, point out her presence, Rusty Hardin today of the prosecution, putting it on the record, saying that he wanted the record to reflect that Ken Paxton has decided to, to, quote, not grace us with his appearance for two days now of this trial. Uh, Paxton noticeably absent. He was present on the first day to enter his plea, which was required by the rules passed by the members of the state Senate. But after that, uh, immediately after that lunch break during opening statements, he was not present and has not been seen at the Capitol since then. And so quite striking that he's decided to not be present during all of these proceedings. So as you heard the Lieutenant Governor say, we're going to take a lunch break until about uh, 115, 120, at which time we will be back here on KVU Plus to bring you more gavel to gavel coverage plus analysis. We've got another guest coming that you'll be able to hear some legal analysis on this trial and how this is all playing out. We hope to see you then.